know how it happened. I started researching 16 years ago. <laughs> And I'm left to conclude once again what I knew all along that the only way out is in. Well, that's certainly true. There's only one thing left to do. What do I do? What do I do? It's up to me to come to you. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm here to tell you about the bar. Well, he had to really, didn't he? You got me where you want me. I surrender. The sheer weight of evidence against the Stratford man is insurmountable, and so here we are, every other Sunday, removing the mask and revealing to you the deepest, most amazing secrets behind this brilliant subterfuge. Tune in and bard out. Streaming live on Facebook, Bard Code, right here, right now, with my very special guest today, Adam Apollo. To be or not to be there? The only one here. <laughs> It's no question. Good day, everybody, and welcome to Bardcast, episode four in a continuing series of 624 Bardcasts, Buddha willing. It's October 4th in the year 2020 of the famously improved but still eh, slightly off Gregorian calendar. As you know by now, each day of the year has a unique Shakespeare sonnet number connected to it, and today's is sonnet one, two, three, which could not be more significant. It's the only sonnet that mentions pyramids. And it starts, No, time, thou shalt not boast that I do change, thy pyramids built up with newer might, to me a nothing novel, nothing strange. They are but dressings of a former sight. Dressings is a mason's term for preparing stones to be placed into a structure. And Shakespeare is clearly telling us he's seen these pyramids before. There's nothing novel or strange about them to him. He's had former sight, former lives where he remembers seeing them, maybe even the building of them. Well, I promise you, I did not plan this for today. October 4th just happens to be that one sonnet. It's one of those perfect synchronicities that happens when your special guest is all about dressings of a former sight, recognizing former lives, meaning reincarnation. We're here to explore who we are. Who we are. Who we are. Who are you really? What are you? Where did you come from? What are you made of? Why is it that the patterns in our bodies are like the patterns we see on the planet? On the planet? What unites, What unites us? us? We're all just figuring out what's going on on the surface and what's going on at the deeper layers. We are an event horizon. And then we become the one and the zero. We complete ourselves. We perceive ourselves. I know that I am, I know that I've been back there, I know that I'm going this direction and I have the power to choose, and now I can be conscious of others. others. That this energy is tangible. You will feel the tingle of entanglement. entanglement. You begin to craft your mind as a crystal, as a structure that you can fit things into. So we'll be diving deep into that today with Adam Apollo, who as a teenager had a cosmic epiphany and witnessed firsthand a vision of 
former lives and, and even deeper was, was graced to experience the universal connectedness of all things. So he will be sharing with us today his insights on cutting edge physics, quantum theory, advanced technologies, and how this all connects at the deepest possible levels with man's eternal quest for truth. And thus, what the future holds for us all if we will but unite science, art, and our true spiritual nature. Now, as always, my task will be to help us see how Shakespeare is pointing us to these very same connections, not just through his long-recognized genius as one of the world's greatest poet dramatists, but through his heretofore unknown abilities, his knowledge of sacred geometry and deep Einsteinian level mathematics, which was so heretical in his day, he had to encode it. Brilliantly hidden in the gravestone shown here behind where I was playing the piano in Holy Trinity Church, Stratford, and in his monument above my head. Sound. So Shakespeare was undoubtedly aware of higher mathematics, completely beyond what we had previously known. Here he's showing us on the cover of the sonnets themselves, perfect right angle triangles connecting the, the dots with the ends of the lines. It's Pythagorean theory, but he's showing us... He's showing us Thales' theorem. When you measure these lines accurately to three point decimals, you end up with all the constants that were known then, but constants that were also not known, <laughs> sometimes hundreds of years. All of them radiating out from this large letter G into an area that is giving us certain angles, and when we measure those angles and you plunk them into Google Earth. Well, <laughs> and as for predicting the geographic coordinates of the Great Pyramid, there, ninety nine point nine 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 per cent accurate on the latitude and 99.99% accurate longitude. Well, they, they didn't even know how to do longitude back then. Galileo was still wrestling with it when Shakespeare died, you know, 25 years after he died. So we're left with this shocking conundrum. How do certain souls gain access to such information? Are we living in a matrix-like hollow fractal universe? in which, if we understand the science behind higher consciousness, we too can, as it were, converse with the gods. Well, Adam Apollo is going to answer some of those questions for us today. He's been a leadership ambassador at the White House in multiple summits at the United Nations, at conferences and festivals around the world. He's a co-founder of the Unify Movement, CEO of Superluminal Systems, which built the Resonance Academy for Uni Unified Physics. He's founder of the Visionary Arts Academy, Academy <laughs> and he currently has over 40,000 students from around the world, and that's probably just in his spare time. So please, put your emojis together for my best friend and colleague, Adam Apollo. Thank you so much, Alan. It's such an honor and pleasure to be here with you today. And um, yeah, you, you put out some giant shoes for me to slide into there with giving people the answers to the life, universe, and everything. But, uh, <laughs> but perhaps we can, you know, 
<laughs> take some 42, put your thing down, flip it and reverse it, make some 24 magic happen. And, and by the end of the day, we shall know ourselves <clears throat> ever more exquisitely. That's always the goal, isn't it? At the end of every day, I hope to know myself slightly more exquisitely than I did the previous day. <laughs> yeah, doesn't exactly. always work out. We have a, we fall back a little. It's all right. We're here to discuss that. So you've had some uh, just uh, uh, amazing experiences that I really, I think it's going to be fascinating for everyone to hear. I want to mm. just start off and cap up on a statement that you made in one of those videos. You, you say, and then you become the one and the zero. Mm. Tell us what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so when I was a teenager and I first began really having my experiences of the everything and nothing, as we may call it, among many other names or namelessness, um, one of the first things that I really came to realize was that there's something really powerful and magical about a circle. And a circle is the way we designate zero. And a circle is empty, right? A, a circle is this just line surrounding something. And that something we could say is nothing. And yet just by the act of setting a container around the nothing, we're actually designating something. So even in the zero, there is a becoming because we're actually making a choice to set a boundary condition around something. And thus there is a becoming. And this in many ways points to the, the deepest origin of what consciousness is. The moment there is consciousness, the moment there is a awareness of a thing, there is a thing. And even the number <laughs> one is fascinating because you can't make a number one without connecting two points together. And so inherent mm. even in the one is the balance of the two and time is required for the one to be expressed. And so in this way, even in the one, we are in the none, and in the none, we are in the one, and the one becomes the two, becomes the three, and so forth, all things. Yeah, beautifully put. Shakespeare himself uh, alludes to it very, very uh, directly. In fact, uh, let me show you just a, a brief presentation that will illustrate that. Right. So here in the sonnets, we've got, he, 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 in sonnet 121, he says, no, I am that I am. And that's quite a uh, controversial one because he's literally saying the name of God that was forbidden at that time to say mm. you could not. King uh, uh, James had issued an edict saying you, you cannot say the name God or any of the versions of it. So I am that I am is, is the name of God given by, by Moses to Moses on Mount Sinai. So he says it right there. I am that I am. So foot right off the bat, that's heretical and uh, could have got him in a lot of trouble. 19 lines later, you get another no. And that's the no for today. That's the no time thou shalt not boast that I do change. Thy pyramids built up with newer might. That's today's sonnet. Today is the that particular day. Now you got 17 lines after that. You got a triple tower on the left hand side. 17 lines. He says, no, it was builded far from accident. He's still talking about the, the pyramid. It's not an accident. It's not some tomb. It wasn't built, you know, accidentally. It has no hieroglyphs on it. People say, you know, no, it's got. No, this was a very, very specific structure that was intentionally built. It suffers not in smiling pomp. It doesn't have the, you know, it doesn't have Khufu's neon light flashing on it saying is my tomb it, it it nor falls under the blow of thrall discontent it's 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 stayed all these years it's earthquake proof etc etc 17 lines later no let me be obsequious in thy heart now obsequious has a slightly different connotation today but in those days it really meant prayerful let me be prayerful in thy heart where's thy heart the, the king's chamber King's chamber, right in thy heart, in, in thy heart, in the heart of the of the pyramid. Another seventeen lines later, he's got another version of no, where there are two parentheses with no thing in them. 
So he's got this pattern where he's going through seemingly, it seems random, 19, 17, 17, 17. But that 17, 17 together are where he says, let me be obsequious in thy heart. And you realize, oh, those are the actual ratios of the king's chamber. When you reduce them, not in feet or meters or cubits, but you just take them to their nearest integer values. They are 19 high by 17 wide by 34 is the length. And that brings you to the center where you are to be obsequious in thy heart and so he's literally telling us about the king's chamber just in that no he spells them no e no 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 e spells the no differently no e his own name is e o earl of oxford so backwards he's saying no there's no me no 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 me i no no I or I zero zero one zero zero. Now on page forty, De Vere's code number was forty. Right at the top, he has King Richard the Second say, "I know no I for I must nothing be." Yes, it's read in the plays as yes, no, no, yes, but they say I like it's A Y E. You know, I no, no, I. He's supposed to be undecided. But he's playing with this idea. It's his, it's his code. To be, not to be, not to be, to be. What am I, am I going to be known? And then he says in the next line, Therefore, no, no, for I resign to thee. His code number is 40. So 4004. He's, he's saying his code number, then reversing it. And if you're not convinced by that, he then takes you through the entire process of being crowned, the, the coronation ritual, but he reverses it all. I give this heavy weight from off my head, this unwieldy scepter from my hand, reverses the entire process of being crowned. He's telling you, I am giving up the crown. So this is very, we get into that later about what de Vere really was. Was he really the monarch? But in Hamlet, he says, the rest is silence, and he ends it with, oh, 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 dies. No good playwright tells a, an actor how to die. Oh, 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 oh. But he puts O, 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 because that's his own version of his I, no, no, I, one, zero, zero, one. It's the same as no, 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 no. It, there are four zeros. His code number is four, zero. So just to complete that, he lets us know that that's what he's doing in the very, very last sonnet. The very last thing he says in all the sonnets, love's fire heats water, water cools not love. But it's an anagram of... Alter Stone solves the final secret of WW. That's part of his encoding for the two W's, two Williams. Evere, I know, no, I. In fact, he signs his name that way. That's how Edward Oxenford signed his name with a two W's interlocked at the top. So that's the very last thing he says in the sonnets. He's telling you the secret to the whole thing is in the altar. Then there's a poem after that, Lover's Complaint after the sonnets. Four zeros. And then... The very last line, and do pervert a reconciled maid, finis. Finis is Latin for finish, the end, right? But another way of saying it in Latin is infine. In the end, print conceals, I am, capital letters for the name of God, I am Edward de Vere. So he <laughs> is literally telling us this over and over and over again. The one, the zero, the zero, one, I, no, no, I. That's his code that he repeats many, 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 many times over. So he talks about it in Sonnet 136, where he says, Among a number one is reckoned none, then in the number let me pass untold, though in thy store's account I one must He's always talking about it, about really saying that the one must become nothing. That's, uh, so my interpretation of it, I'd I love to hear yours where you're talking about just the geometry of it, which of course is true on that other, other level, the mathematics of it. But on, a, on, a, uh, on the spiritual level, he's really saying, you want to get back to who, re who you really are? The ego has to go. The yeah. ego of the I identification. The mm -hmm. I has to go. That one. In fact, the sonnet number one is the only sonnet that has no number. You open up the sonnets and there's no number one. Then there's two, three, four, five, six. So he's riffing on this all the time. So it really struck me that when you said that in that contact in the desert um, video, you were probably going far deeper into that in terms of what those people are interested in. And uh, we might get into that as well. 
But the point yeah, is, what I, I find really fascinating is the moment where you say, you know, uh, is he is is he the monarch? Is there a link there? And and you know, to me, one of the most important things to recognize about kingship and monarchy in general, but but it's it's really the divine right of kings that I'm getting at is that no one can just pass kingship to another person like you're you're born of someone it doesn't just mean all of a sudden you're a king like this this idea of the passing of of the blood um is i think you know a construction that was made uh in a period of time in order to isolate power to specific families but when you really get down to it where does the origin of kingship what is the origin of this this divine art of taking leadership of a land and becoming one with the land and the people so deeply that one can literally embody the the movements and the pulse and the timing of that people and serve truly serve the needs of that people going distant into the future and i think that that does require this removal of the eye it requires the self to acknowledge and realize that it is the people and it is the land that is the body of the king. And so the king must come into awareness, expand their field of energy, their field of consciousness to such an extent that they are holding that realm, holding that land. And perhaps now in times like this, we must learn how to expand ourselves so greatly we can hold the whole planet in order to live in a way that's truly in leadership for the future of this earth. Um, but certainly in the way that Shakespeare wrote and spoke and taught through this magic that he left us, this encrypted library that he left us, um, there is so many moments where you can see that he is embodying the dynamics and the dramas and the energies of the people, the challenges, their suffering, their discovery, their growth, and and it's it's mirrored inside of his works and you can literally feel the texture of that time period and that age and those lands and those peoples through his work so i would say most certainly that i would recognize him as a king indeed yeah in other words you're saying it's also more of a it's an initiatory thing as well isn't it you know you have yes. to deserve the right and it's it's awkward because when we look back on that monarchical time and the feudal system, um, obviously it doesn't resonate for us. We we got away from there. We say, oh, okay, we don't want that. We want to get away from it. We want to have a republic, right? Mm. Unfortunately, it seems as though uh, that it's true that the moment uh, absolute power is achieved, it becomes it's it's there's the temptation to corrupt it and kingship rears its head again you know yeah. uh, it, it, it it's almost sadly inevitable if we're living still in the darker yugas the darker ages where we just do not understand this concept of unity we're, we're all yeah. the, we're all one right oh no 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 i'm better than you yeah yeah we're all one i grant you that we, 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 we distribute the crumbs off the table mm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh let's not get too carried away with that right well um, i mean <laughs> democracy itself interestingly enough it seems to me that that our desire for actual real democracy not saying that we actually have that currently as much as we think um but mm. the, our desire for democracy is the desire to feel that resonance and participation with someone who is a leader who's going to totally embody what it is that you believe in, right? So we're actually oh, longing yeah. for that same level of leadership. In the past, it was just, you know, a lot of different lords, so to speak, longing for leadership among them that would stop the conflicts so they could unite behind one banner, right? And, and in a real sense, this is what we're dealing with now is, is the need to somehow unite behind a greater banner, a banner that's bigger than red versus blue, you know, or conservative versus liberal, but something that actually encompasses 
the needs of the people, which are diverse and require both, you know, the the gifting of the gargantuan budgets of the government to serve education for our children and our roads and our streets and all of that, and also mm -hmm. keep the governments out of our face and out off our backs and give us the space to create our lives and our business and not ha not have them all up in our mess, you know. So mm -hmm. it's it's we're we're longing for something greater, and we're I think all seeking and and starting to discover that that there is a bigger game at play here now and mm. and uh you know perhaps with the age of aquarius thing it's that we actually need to discover our own kingship and learn how to be in service to each other yeah i'm convinced it, it, it is that I, i'm not going to go into that part of shakespeare today because it's still a work in progress but i'm currently mm. doing something on what's called the fisher king series and nice. it is so utterly clear from what he has embedded in that encryption that he's referencing back, yes, we're in a feudal system, yes, we have a monarchy, yes, you've got to give deference, yes, it's important that the lineage is followed. If you're the true monarch, you should be the next true monarch. But at the same time, he makes it very, very clear that it's a really screwed up system and that we should be getting away from it. And in fact, that's what they were doing. They were literally starting this whole adventure to colonize what uh, Bacon called the New Atlantis, uh, what uh, the sonnets called uh, the adventures, adventurers in setting forth. They were colonizing Virginia and then Jamestown, because named after James when James. Was, so we were right at that cusp of saying, all right, this system isn't working anymore. We're going to start a new one off with the old into the new. So he's saying that very thing. But I want to get to where, you know, where that dovetails with the incredibly deep spiritual and scientific work that, that you and many others are doing. Um, you, 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 you have this experience that when you were very young. I want to play a brief clip of you introducing that and, and perhaps you, you, you could go deeper into it for us. Sure, thank you. Early on in this process, um, I had a vision. We, there was just this moment where I kind of phased out and the next thing I knew I was in this vision. And the vision was showing me how every layer of the entire universe, starting with my own eyeball and my own body and the plane around me and the earth around me to how the moon rotates around the earth to the solar system to the galaxy were all connected in similar patterns. Mm -hmm. and, and then eventually I began to see the entire universe as actually part of an energetic thread that was creating protons, mm -hmm. creating the fabric of space itself. Mm -hmm. and, and I saw how the same patterns that form the nucleus of an atom and the way that the electrons flow around that nucleus and chain together to create amino acids and DNA is exactly the same kind of rotational, energetic, uh, vibrational lensing that we see as the solar system is traveling through the galaxy right. and rotating and spiraling with other stars in these very consistent high-level gravitational relationships. And I, I realized through this vision that showed me the, the smallest stuff in the universe, you know, being composed of the biggest things in the universe, that there is this perfect connection between the macrocosm and the microcosm. And uh, as you end there with that perfect connection between the macrocosm and the microcosm, I mean, really, uh, that in a way just sums it up. And then you can actually just riff on that for hours and hours. <laughs> can we do something in between the two? Uh, <laughs> tell us, uh, um, well, go wherever you want with that. I'd love to hear about uh, deeper about your own experience because that is utterly fascinating and I think people will be really deeply interested in, in it. What, what was this vision that you had? How did it come about? And more, more to the point, how has it led you to the life you live now and, and your, your work, which is really your mission? You know? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first, I just want to say that, you know, a lot of times people believe and they think that that great spiritual visions, awakenings, these, these moments of Satori, as they say, 
require us to, to be deeply trained and meditating and going through a process <laughs> or be in a temple or be in a super sacred magical place on earth. I was a teenage kid, 15 years old, and I was sitting on a couch with two of my buddies uh, while they're playing Tekken, a video game, and battling <laughs> each other. And we're listening to Jimmy Buff, like Cheeseburger in Paradise, right? <laughs> and I, I, I'm, this is the context of where I'm sitting and I'm, I'm watching them fight in the game and listening to the music and I just kind of start drifting off in my mind. And then the next thing I know, I'm bam, I'm like in this vision and it was just clear as day, like looking back at my own eyeball. And, you know, I, I kind of summarized it in my conversation with Ruben, but, but really it was this experience of looking at an eye and then all of a sudden everything zooming out really fast. And it was like body, earth, you know, and then I'm looking at the whole planet and I'm seeing the dance of the earth and the moon and I'm feeling the, the wave form that it's making around the sun. And then I'm feeling all the planets as these different wave forms in the solar disk, which is actually this giant gravitational lens that's actually just focusing light in different ways that's traveling through the galaxy and intergalactically. And then I'm seeing the chain of our sun's lens, this solar disk, traveling in these waves with other stars. I'm seeing the whole galaxies sort of spiraling interconnection. And then I'm seeing galaxy after galaxy, after galaxy, after galaxy, after galaxy, you know, Lani Achaea, as we call it now, this massive galactic cluster that we're a part of. And, and it's sort of living, breathing, threading as part of more and more and more giant super clusters until Literally, my whole vision was just filled with galaxies in every direction, and 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 it just all started to blur into white light. And I started to see that white light. It didn't stop there. I really saw that light that the whole universe was composing as part of these sort of fractal spiraling threads going into what looked like, you know, uh, vortices like nautilus shells and curling in these these waveforms and and it was like all of these kind of interesting just just like patternings and structures and just really base level geometric connections that at the time I didn't really understand or learn to you know know how to identify but as I as I got older and I started really studying the structure of the universe and unified physics I started realizing what I was seeing was lattices of hexagons with pentagon intersections and geodesics layered and layered and layered on each other. And in my vision, what I just saw was all these layers of geometry becoming this sphere and these spheres balancing and spinning and flying with each other and then actually forming as I started to realize the nucleus of an atom. And then I started to see that, that this nucleus was creating these waved chains of light that I, I realized were electrons. And it was these waves traveling between these sort of nuclear cores that were creating these, these like long spiraling chains, just the way the like infinite universes were spiraling chains, just the way the sun and its planets were spiraling chains moving through the galaxy. And these spiraling chains, as I, as I got to see them at this scale, I realized I was looking at DNA and, and it was the DNA was generating through a field, these large crystalline spheres, again, made of geometry that were proteins and layer after layer after layer, it came together until I came out of the pupil of my own eye. And I lo was looking again at this eye and it, it stopped in the moment that I was able to see that eye and the entire experience seemed like it took me probably you know i i, I don't know it was timeless the the level of depth the level of detail the level of the whole experience and yet when i turned to look at the game that my buddies were playing i realized they were literally in the same exact moment of the game as when my vision started and the, the verse <laughs> uh, jimmy buffett's song is still on the same verse like nothing had passed, no time. Like 
It was, it all happened in less than a split second. And, and I just was like, I felt like I was, you know, smoking. It was just like, you know, just this like, oh my God, what the f just happened, you know? And, um, and it was crazy because I was like, wait, what? And then I would just rethink about that eye again. And all of a sudden it would go, I, <laughs> back to the eye. Like, as if I could just replay the whole thing just in super fast forward. And I did all the time for like, uh, well, I have off and on throughout my entire life, but, but at least that period of my life, I used to just use that as a way to just zap myself hmm. into consciousness. Isn't that because great? How I mean, can you it's... not be? The, even the just the word I and again Shakespeare uses this over and over and over again uh, <laughs> it's interesting in the first folio that's the, the big book of the 36 plays that's the most expensive textbook in the world last one yeah. went on sale at Sotheby's six million dollars just for one book um, uh, in Hamlet he says I there's the rub and everybody assumes he's saying I A Y E yes there's the rub right because sure. it's, the, it's the to be or not to be speech right yeah. Uh, I'm a bit scared of killing myself because what comes next? Uh, what mm -hmm. dreams may come and all that. You know, can I just cop out of this, my, my, my uh, obligation here to avenge my father? He's in a real mess about it. But he says, yeah. aye, there's the rub. But then when you look in the actual folio, it's I, there's mm -hmm. the rub. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. me, I have to be rubbed out. Again, he's saying the same thing. I've got to get rid of this. Not that the ego, I don't want to be giving the impression to people that he's saying it's bad or, or, or I don't, it's all God, right? There's nothing wrong with the ego. It's a beautiful thing. We get to build whole civilizations and great art with it. And obviously all artists have got to have a hefty dose of ego and scientists. And we all have to. We're, we're here in a body. We are not yet in that saintly state of omniscience that you're kind of describing. It's, it's not your everyday consciousness, right? But the idea that you can kind of learn to dip into it and come back out is a, is a, is a wonderful feeling. I'm so excited that you brought up a couple of um, aspects of it. One, because I want to get into this for you, for you, all of us on this audience, in, in the audience right now. As Adam said, don't feel that this is, oh, yeah, all very well for you. You know, you're Adam Apollo, or we might hear, you know, Vivekananda saying it, or Paramahansa Yogananda, or the Buddha sitting there saying, yes, I am one with the universe. And we all have that feeling, well, <laughs> fine for you, mate. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, well. Fine for you, I'm sitting on a privy. This is a big stake. <laughs> I don't have, uh, I don't have eighteen hours free to meditate every day, mate. All right. Um, it's, it, but honestly, um, so I, I want to ask a question of you all. Comment, send your comments in right now while this topic is hot. Have any of you had a a, a similar experience? It doesn't have to be the you know the ultimate or whatever something out of the ordinary that made you realize you are not just this body you are not just this this fragile little being stuck on this tiny little planet i think it's far more common than we think i think people generally speaking probably have a an inkling of an experience like this and many 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 people have this deep, deep sartori experience as well. It's it's really quite common, but people do, you, you know, they're cautious about saying it in case their friends look at them like they've gone crazy and they've gone overboard. So that's one aspect of it. Uh, did you experience any any of that sort of? Uh, <laughs> all right. Oh yeah, yeah, mate. Yeah, very good. What have you been smoking? Uh, thing from your friends or or. And beyond that, even, if you can answer this question, because I'm really, it, it fascinates me. And I, as I say, I'm glad you brought it up. It's not limited to saintly beings. It's right. your birthright. It's suddenly being thrust into a moment of such clarity that you realize the truth, even for a moment. And you go, oh, I'm really the whole thing. <laughs> and the whole and you might be. You are the whole shebang. And so 
uh, please, if any of you have that, that, you want to make any comments on that, please, please do. Uh, and I'm just going to ask you, Adam, one, one ancillary question to that. So did it come with any... Well, you've already said it's, it, it, it's been a lasting experience. You can go back into it at, at will, which is really, really wonderful. Did it carry with it any... Did you come away with any sort of methodology that you could teach somebody? Say, you know, you know, what I did was this. Why don't you try this? Or did it just seem like, well, this was my experience and I can't really communicate how I got there. Therefore, to a certain degree, it's, it's maybe grace... And then the grace came, and then I, that triggered me, so I now know how to go there, but I can't really explain it to you, Fred, because, you know, I mean, how do you go about that? Have you been able to pass it on to others, and is there a methodology that you can say, yeah, you can experience that, do this? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a decent stack of inquiries in those questions. Um, first off, I will say in the moment, uh, I had no idea how to share this with my buddies and, um, and yet, you know, I, I tried and, uh, they just kind of looked at me blankly and didn't really know how to, how to take it. They're just like, Oh, Adam's had another crazy experience. Um, they knew though at the time that I, I was undergoing a huge transformation because I had um, earlier that same year, um, gone through an experience where I discovered that if I stuck my fingertips together and I very slowly separated them apart and focused on the space between them, that I could actually feel a tangible field connecting my fingertips. And that threw me into a realization process where I started playing all kinds of games, um, forming spheres of what I eventually learned was called chi or prana um, by doing lots of searches on the internet. Cause at first I'm a 15 year old kid who thinks I discovered the force, you know? And I'm like, whoa, man, this is crazy. <laughs> and it wasn't just me, it was me and my buddy, Chris, and he was a few years older than me. And, um, you know, we, I, I learned very quickly that I could show anybody what this feels like, what chi feels mm. like and energy feels like. And every time it's the thing that somebody's like, what, what is that? What are you doing? How come no one has ever showed me this before? Why is this not in school? Why have my parents not know about this? Why does nobody know about this? And, and every person that I, you know, had a deep dive with around this, you know, they generally come out with it going like, I don't know what the, what, what that's about. And, but for me, it was like, I finally found this key that unlocked this library of wisdom and knowledge inherent to myself that I'd been passing to myself through the ages. It was like I came of age to draw the sword that I needed. And, and in this process was getting all of these downloads and realizations and playing with how energy moves in different forms and, and playing with blindfolded martial arts and locating an object using human dousing across the room. Uh, I was actually just on a, a Zoom call the other night with a couple of friends in Austin and um, they're young and, and kind of exploring different things and were asking me a bunch of questions. And I got them to actually practice doing a few things like making a ball and filling it with an element of, of energy and sharing it with the other and having the other person describe what it feels like to see how accurate it is, to see how, uh, how clearly they can feel what's actually there. And it's beautiful watching because it might take a one try or two, but usually by the second, third or fourth try, the person receiving starts actually describing exactly what that person made in their hands without them saying anything, without there being any description. It's literally just someone, you know, building a ball and passing it to somebody else. And, and they tried the like locating objects using the tingle on their hands uh, in the room and first try found exactly where the hidden object was. Um, and these kinds of what I like to call Jedi games are, mm -hmm. I think really powerful practices to kind of break down the mental resistance that we have to the truth of who we are. Yeah. Because, because that's really the thing that I was doing is I was breaking down 
the walls of my belief systems. I was exploring the potential possibilities that were inherent to this sort of energetic reality in which I'm immersed in a unified field. And that, that was just enough stretching open, for, I think, for my mind and for my being that then I was able to be a conduit of this gift of grace and have this first uh, divine revelation experience. And it was really just the first of many different ones. It's the one that's most easily described. It's the one that's got the most fantastic visual experience. But of mm -hmm. course, you know, in later experiences, things like experiencing the divine love, the source of all love of the universe, like there are no words for that. Like I couldn't tell you a tale about it's what it's like to feel the infinite eternal love bursting from every iota of existence from the beginning to the end of time. That's something that you can only just experience through the pure transmission of soul resonance. If, if you know what I'm talking about, then you're already feeling it because it's it's <laughs> it's ever well, present. Uh, yeah. You know? And and yet it's something that I think we we um, we fail to allow ourselves to surrender to often. Oh, enough. good word. Good word. Um, that, well, that that's a neat segue for I mean, I, I want to I want to say briefly that, yeah, in asking that question, I'm I'm trying to get to. Um, was there a, uh, any knowledge within your experience that you could say, "Oh yes, I I know exactly how to replicate this," but it's also a method that I can pass on uh, to others. You experienced it in a way that was uh, uh, your own unique experience, and I'm sure everyone who experiences such uh, deep states of grace. Uh, I'm sure it's unique for every single soul because that's the beautiful relationship between the divine and all of us. And yet, that's that mystery, isn't it? We're all the same being. Shakespeare says it, utter, I mean, the, the simplest way Shakespeare says it is he puts it into Twelfth Night uh, where you've got this, and I often quote this because it's just such a, a hopeful sort of vision for us all. He puts the words, the greatest words of wisdom into always into the clown, the fool, mm. or uh, a drunkard. Mm. <laughs> and he has this drunkard in, in Twelfth Night, Sir Toby Belch. What a great name. So, <laughs> so they, they play it that Mr. way. Mr. Belch. Going, How know, are you today, they're Mr. Going Mr. Around. Belch? He's drinking Bro. throughout the whole play. <laughs> He's partying all the time. It's, he's a yeah. very, very funny character. But he says his lines that are pertinent to the scene. And then he says, as he's leaving, he goes, or, I won't do the belch now because I'll, if I start, I'll, I'll you know, <laughs> I, when you do a first belch, you know, and then it, it, it starts coming and coming. And then you, it becomes yeah. a belch fest. You can't, you yeah. just can't do it. So I won't do the actual belch, though I can do a good one. If anybody wants to actually hear it, I'll record I it. I believe you, I believe you. I'll, I'll post it. Um, sure. So Toby belches, <laughs> and he says at the end of a scene, apropos of nothing, he says, it's all one, and then he leaves. It's all one. I mean, how can you sum up the entire mystery of the universe in three words any better than that? It's all one, and it happens four times, he says it twice, and then the clown sa says it back, not to him, but to Malvolio, four time, uh, two, two times. It's all one. So that's how, I mean, you can go as simple as that. Shakespeare just said, bump, got it. It's all one. Yep. Next question. What do you worry about? <laughs> all, all, all the world's a stage, all the men and women are merely players. We have our entrances, yep. our exits, right? Reincarnate, go, get in, get out, do your thing, try again. Um, but, <laughs> and then there's this other extreme of, well, there are avatar beings who come to this earth, like a Buddha, like a Muhammad, like a Jesus Christ, like all the great ones that we hear about, that, that come and tell us the truth of our being. And some of them actually bring a, me a methodology. They will say, well, look, I can initiate you into this particular pranayama technique and you, you're working with the energy so i'll give you a technique can't talk about it because it's an initiatory process and it is a private thing between you and your master or guru or whatever you want to call this this being but that's their job and they do actually come in with a method they actually tell you do this 
and this will happen. Do this, and this will be the result. Shakespeare himself says it in the very, very last play, the last uh, sonnet, rather. He says, this by that I prove. This by that I prove. Strong word, prove. How, what are you proving? Oh, he's proving the mathematics on the cover of the science. I get it. Yeah, he, he, he could actually prove something. But these beings can come. So I, I never proselytize. So I'm not ever saying, oh, you should go and do this. You will find your own path. Everybody finds their own path. But I want to, um, it does lead me. You said surrender. So I just, I thought, I'll wait until, if Adam says something like this, I will, uh, I will, I will do this thing. Let me show you a little bit of a presentation that can give you how I got into into this, which was, you know, pretty different from the way you're describing it, and yet its essence is the same thing. Now I'm I, I'm going to curtail, curtail this, but I I call the presentation the missing eye, right? That missing eye, the eye. There's the rub, or how to manifest a hundred thousand ton luxury cruise liner. Now. <laughs> the reason I called it that is because um, when I was a kid, uh, my middle name is William, by the way. I, n I, I don't often uh, say much about that uh, because I never liked it. I, di I didn't like that name. I thought somehow it, it, it was um, a weak name and until I realized, oh, you know. So I wasn't into Shakespeare at all. But then I did begin, once I got into my teens, I realized, oh, I am Will. Oh, it's that. But when I was a young kid, I, I absolutely detested the name William. And uh, <laughs> I don't even know why. It's, I think it, it just came from parental uh, uh, happenings. But I, did, I had read a lot of the books about, you know, Think and Grow Rich and how to win friends and influence people and all the usual stuff that you first get into that talk about mind control. How do you want to... You know, make something happen. Do you want to manifest something in your life? Well, what have you got to do? You've got to think about your positive thoughts and your negative thoughts. Think positive. You know, everybody tells you that, right? But think positive. Um, I, I don't know where I got this from. I just got the sense that there's a timeline uh, that is from now Heading out to the right there, I, I put the timeline. I drew a circle. I just, I just simply made this thing up myself. And I thought, well, if I'm thinking 50% positive thoughts and 50% negative thoughts, then at the end of the day, I'm going to be no, nowhere further along. And I wanted to manifest this 100,000-ton cruise ship. Um, i just got to ask, are you hearing me, Adam? Yeah. Okay, good. I, I just wanted to make sure of that because we had a tiny technical glitch at the beginning that we were not quite sure was reconciled. So Sound great. I'm I'm looking for. I'm tr I want to manifest that ship. So I bought a picture of a cruise ship and I stuck it on my wall because I wanted to be on a cruise ship. I want to get away from Manchester really badly. Believe me, <laughs> rain, rain capital of the world, <laughs> fog yeah. and rain. That's what Manchester was, you know. Blowing uh, Manchester. So I wanted these blue seas and I wanted the the life and the palm trees. So I, I I put this picture on my wall. Didn't know how to meditate, but I sat there thinking of it every night, looking at it and saying, well, if I envision myself on it really hard and really focused act like I am already there then I'm attracting it but then as you know the moment you go away from that the mind starts going <laughs> who are you kidding <laughs> you're gonna get on a bloody cruise ship are you who are you kidding mate you're from Manchester you're never gonna get out of this town it's never gonna happen in the bloody Bahamas you know your mind starts saying that because that's your input and so if you, at the end of the day, have done 50% positive thoughts, 50% negative thoughts, where are you? You're absolutely nowhere. You haven't attracted anything. You've repelled it. So I started to realize that if I could make my positive thoughts 75% and only 25% negative, I just drew a line down there to the timeline, and I realized that's the point at which I will manifest my ship. All right? I don't know how long that is. I don't know if that's a month or a year or 10 years, or what, but I know it's a certain amount on the timeline. And I was kind of assuming that that timeline was something that I could punctuate by saying, well, if I'm 90 percent positive and really only ever 10 percent, I will obviously get that ship sooner. Just makes sense, right? Mathematically, it's there on the line, not knowing whether that's months, weeks or what. So, but obviously, if I'm only thinking 60% and 40% of the time, I'm going, oh, you stupid thing. What do you, why are you thinking? You know, I mean, that's the mind, isn't it? The chatter of the monkey. 
It's just like, mm, can't get it. And you're going, <laughs> I like can't. This trigonometry I, for manifestation. It is exactly that because I got, I literally, <laughs> I built myself a system and I don't know yep. where I got it from. I just said, that's it. I'm going to concentrate on that. Well, lo and behold, I thought I was working at it so hard that I found I could get my, I really felt I was somewhere vacillating between 90 and 95% all the time because I was sitting there saying, I've got it. I've got it. I see myself. I see the, the trees. I see myself at the grand piano. I just, and I'd go away and think, oh, maybe not. Shut up. Maybe it will never. Shut up. <laughs> it's going to happen, right? You've got to be vigilant. Well, after, you know, you think about that for a while and you realize, well, what is this? Because that then stumps you. If my method is true, what is 100% positive and 0% negative? That means, oh, I can work miracles, right? I can manifest now. Well, obviously, I can't manifest now. And so the, the moment you say, obviously, I can't manifest now, you've already thought a negative thought. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you, it's just the moment you say that. Isn't yeah. that interesting? You think, mm -hmm. Now, there can be a certain amount of bombastic self-will that we see in, in very successful business people. <laughs> and maybe, maybe, that's what it, maybe that's what it takes to be an Elon Musk. You know, I can do it. I can go to Mars. I, I don't care what you say. I'm going to be, you know, obviously that's what happens with the Richard Bransons of the world or the uh, scientists who do that. So anyway, it made me think about that, but I wasn't concerned about that because that meant that you could manifest now. I was just happy to be doing 95% and lo and behold, I get a call from a guy after about three months of doing this and he says, um, uh, would you like to go on a cruise ship to the Bahamas? I hear you're a very good, uh, pretty good piano player, right? I said, yeah. I didn't know the person. Out of the blue, he says, yeah, uh, my pianist just died. He was uh, uh, killed in a bar fight in Manchester. And I thought, oh, OK. So I felt great that I'd got the job and I'm bad that I'd caused somebody to die a horrific death. But nevertheless, I was off and running. So <laughs> I had manifested my cruise ship in, in, in three months. Uh, and it had come to pass, and I named the ship the MS I Am Will. So, and I remember being on this cruise ship, and we went through a hurricane once where it was tossing and turning like this, and I'm the only person up on the prow. Everyone else is below decks throwing up, and I'm on the prow, and I'm doing my best. You know that Colonel Dan thing in Forrest Gump? I go, you call this a storm? <laughs> not, because I was, not because I was mad at God, but because I was feeling the power of it. I was thinking, my God, this is the power of the universe. I can tap into that. Whoa, it's tossing this ship around like a little cork on the... On the ocean. Well, we were actually in the center of a freaking, you know, hurricane. Yeah. But I wasn't scared. I, I lived through that experience. We got to port. I came home and I went on a ma what I called a manifesting spree. I'll be very, very quick with this because it sounds a bit self-serving. The point I'm getting to is I, I really want to. I love this story. Don't, don't feel it. Don't, don't slow it down on my part. <laughs> well, well I mean, no, but I, there's a there's something for for everybody in this because I really want you to get it because it, it it's it's the most wonderful thing to be able to say oh this this is a method now I'm off the ship now and I what I really want is a record deal so I'm doing the same thing with a picture of a record deal in front of me and I'm saying oh, I've got a record deal I see myself signing a record deal I see myself in the studio I see myself playing the piano I see all the adoring women around going oh. He's so marvelous. You know, <laughs> that's what I wanted, right? And you're going, I'm going to get a record deal. And within nine months, it took nine months of focusing like this, I got a record deal. And there I am with my silly tuxedo on, the jazz pianist. I was, though, I must say... Looking good, word? Alan. I must say, what was the word? I was an um, arsehole. That's it. I was an <laughs> arsehole to <laughs> work for. And I, and I soon destroyed that record deal. It just wouldn't last. But I knew I could, well, what does it matter? I'll just make another one. And in six months, I manifested another one. And I'm getting better and better at it. And that one, I was also hard to work with. So I lost that one. And finally, I'm going, all right, I'm going to go for the big enchilada. I want Clive Davis to sign me to Arista. And I manifest the Clive Davis one in four months. Now, the reason I'm saying all this is, and I pissed him off as well. So didn't it didn't go anywhere but i had learned the method of manifesting i thought so i go i've run out of possibilities in england for new record contracts so <laughs> i come to america and i go and i 
like bang on the doors of 21 record labels in Los Angeles, all of which refused me. And so all of a sudden I was feeling, oh, I thought I had a method here. It's not working. Now, so the point I'm making about this is Planet Records was Richard Perry. He'd just opened it up. Big guy, you know, Barbra Streisand, Harry Nielsen, Ringo Starr, Lennon. He produced everybody. He just started his own label. So I thought, I know. I can definitely convince him. I'll find out where he lives and I'll break into his home and give him a tape, which is what I did. To which he responded like that. And so, <laughs> and I'm serious. I give him a tape and I'm saying, oh, I know this is the wrong way to do this. I just walk through his gates when somebody left after playing tennis, you know, and I walk in and I knock on his door and he comes to the door. So I said, oh, I know it's the wrong way to do this, but I've just been dropped from Arista, but my stuff is good and you've got to listen to it, please. And he said, this is the wrong way to do this. I'm going to call the cops. Don't need to call the cops. I'm gone. Thank you. Bye. So literally I was at the end of my tether. There was some point I'm getting to is there's something missing. There's something missing, that missing eye, was what I had to learn from that experience. Because what I thought was happening was, I can do this. I can make this happen. I am the power. I am the power. And I've got it all. Now, it's a fine line, isn't it? Because we do. That's the, that's the tightrope. You do. And yet, if you get too cocky with it, you don't. And I was, getting too, I was getting too cocky with it. So anyway, the bottom line on all this is that there's my wonderful methodology and all of a sudden it's not working at all and I, all my positivity went down, down, down to utterly zero and I was immensely in debt and I started driving across the States to regroup with a friend back in Chicago and say, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm massively in debt. I've got a rental car on my American Express card. It's going to be taken away from me. I think, thought I was going to debtor's prison because we had that in England. Mm. I start driving back, and I literally didn't know what I was going to do, except here's the, here's, here's the kicker for us all. Suddenly, that moment of now just happened, and I mm. found myself in an experience similar to what you were having. And my experience was that... Now, for me, it wasn't going out into galaxies spiraling and all. I mean, that, you know, you kind of went out, 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 out. I went down to the tiniest, 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 tiniest thing and sort of stayed there. And at, at one point I was realizing, oh, it really is all one. I, I understood that there is no such thing as hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen fluorine, neon, sodium, there's no, you know, just because they've got different numbers of electrons. It's all one building block put together in different combinations so that it all looks like different things. And mm. that means that I am that one thing and you are that one thing and everything around me is that one thing. And in that moment, everything just went <laughs> down to a moment of just what you said. Now, it was an eternal now. And I real and I'm, I, it, you know, I won't, I won't go into the, depth of what I and uh, <laughs> my God were talking about, but it was essentially, you know, you think you're pretty smart, don't you? You think you're just the cat's whiskers. Every time you're playing a new song for a group of friends and one person isn't listening, you get pretty upset, don't you? Well, he'd nailed me there. It was like... You're yeah. really just a coxcomb, as Shakespeare would say. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just... <laughs> It's just, you really think, you know, why aren't you paying attention? Giving your pearls, pearls before swine here. Like ego, talk about ego. You know, it's like, oh, why isn't this person paying attention to me? This is great stuff. And essentially, in a nutshell, it came through as this. God, divine, whatever you want to call it, because you know when that's what you're in touch with, says, I'm doing this all the time. And hardly anyone's paying any attention. And in that moment, it just went, and I, and I was where you were. I was seeing this, the, the sap in the trees. I was seeing the electrons in the steering wheel of the car that I'm driving. And I'm just going, I'm driving on the freeway slower and slower and slower and slower. I have to stop the car. I drop uh, out on the, on, the, on the grass at the side of the car. And in that moment, I know that I'm in this state of 100% positivity because I... 
literally said, what, what do you want? I said, you know what I want. I'm, uh, I'm so in debt and I want a record deal. And, uh, meh, meh, meh. Poor me, you know. Okay, so just ask. Got it. And in that moment, I asked for a record deal, but I also asked for specifically. He said, well, how much do you want? And I knew I could ask for a million dollars at that moment because well, it's just zeros. But I asked for exactly what I needed to get out of debt and to live for a year and write the album that became I Surrender. I asked for $60,000 because I made a quick calculus. I need $60,000. says, OK, well, that's that done. Done. Next. What else? What else should we talk about? And I was in that state of utter I couldn't find a negative thought. I went looking in my head for a negative thought. What if? No, there was no what if. So I I knew I had it, and I'm driving back. And as I'm driving back into Los Angeles from this moment of utter clarity, there were no positive thoughts. There were no negative thoughts. All that disappeared. There was no time. There was just this now. And I remember feeling the really curious, beautiful thing of just... Oh, this will last forever now. I, this is it. I, I knew I was one with every. I didn't feel any different from the car, the trees, the air, the stars as I was driving back at night, all of it, and no negative thought anywhere. I knew I had asked for it, and I had it at that moment. And it was so solid that I, w I remember driving into Los Angeles next morning and seeing a bank, and I, did not comp I couldn't comprehend what it was. Why? W what's a bank? Why would you need a bank? I've, I've got my bank here. I just ask for what I need and I get it. I saw insurance company. Didn't know what that meant. Why would you, why would you need an insurance company? And I get back. I'm sleeping on the couch of a friend, you know, another musician. Everything's shimmering like this. It stayed, and this guy calls me. This guy calls me. He says, uh, <laughs> my name is Arlen. At that time. So uh, he says, Arlen, I, uh, I just listened to your tape uh, uh, yesterday around about noon, which is exactly the moment I said, I've got it. It is exactly the moment. He says, uh, uh, I don't know why. I just listened to it. I thought you were crazy when you came by. I thought you were going to kill me. But uh, anyway, uh, I listened to it. It's the best thing I've heard in ages. Come to my house. I'd like to discuss a record deal with you. You know where I live. <laughs> <laughs> and that meant and I got $60,000 and so what I want to convey from that is literally this system works I can't guarantee the 100% part of it because that's such a that's a, such a mystical thing it has never happened to me since that I've uh, so dramatically in 42 years you know, but I can consistently be up in that 95% range. And what I'm urging people is to say, say, you know, it doesn't matter. Adam was not a saint when he had his experience. I was not a saint. Right, far from it. I was a bit of a really screwed up, messed up, egotistical musician trying to be a rock star. It doesn't matter to the divine. I don't know what it uh, what do, I think it's just the readiness, the willingness to be broken and reformed. I mean, you couldn't have had that at 15. It wasn't that for you. So you obviously, well, whatever. It, it, we, you can't examine it. But what I want to talk about from that is that literally, um, if anybody feels that they want it, I mean, it's just, I'm just saying it's a method. It works. If you can be vigilant, and anyone can be vigilant, anyone can be vigilant and say, I can put myself in this area of 90% positivity. All it takes is to simply be vigilant. Every time you catch yourself saying, oh, I can't do that, mm, re cancel it out with two positive thoughts. And as you develop that habit, it becomes stronger and stronger. And then you will find you are manifesting into your life what it is you are asking for. So I wanted to pass that along. If anybody wants these diagrams, please write to us at uh, support at to be or not to be dot org, and uh, we'll we'll just send them to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thanks for bearing with me with that. I honestly wanted to pass that along because to me, mm -hmm. it's the whole thing of wow. You know, how does that happen? You don't have to be anyone special, and yet you realize we're all we're all it. We're all everyone special. 
um, well, state of yeah. And yeah. Alan, you know, you you point to a beautiful uh, a beautiful aspect of this sort of gateway of initiation, which is that you know you can go you can go infinitely out to get infinitely yeah. in. You can also go <laughs> infinitely in to get infinitely, to get infinitely out. out. Yeah, um, it's all the same thing. Well, a lot of the the greatest moments of realization in my life happened in some of the lowest points, the darkest moments of shadow when I really was lost. And yeah. and from that place of absolute loss, surrendering and realizing that I hadn't lost a thing at all because the only thing that's left when you lose everything is you and who you are. And Freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Bobby McGee. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you had this experience of grace that told you we are living in a hollow fractal universe at, at such an incomprehensible age. I mean, I, it's no wonder your friends couldn't really you know, comprehend if you're all 15. You say Chris was 17 or so. Um, so where, did that stay with you that you realized, oh, this is literally true? And, and did that send you onto your journey to find what you could learn about what your experience was well what were these things that i was seeing like you say later you realized I, they were yeah i fairly became obsessed with it for the next many years um i actually ended up from from that point in time um most of all the study that i was really doing in high school um through whatever classes i could pick and choose usually if i could pick geology astronomy um the most scientific stuff that I could get myself into, the better, because I was obsessively looking to see if our understanding of reality in the sciences matched up with what I became aware of in these universal patterns. And, and it was beautiful because no matter where I went, whether it was in my you know, AP English class and studying Beowulf and understanding the power of of will to literally claim I am going to defeat the, the you know, and yeah. just like channeling the full <laughs> force of self to overcome, you know, the, the, the shadow or the challenge. Um, and, and then of course the, the complete opposite of that, the total temperance of Eagle, the total surrender that it requires for someone in nature with animals to actually sit and be so it one with the background, the, the, the grass, you know, the field to be able to be present with these wild animals right in front of them, displaying all of their incredible brilliance and characteristics. Um, there's a new David Attenborough film that's actually, I think, releasing today, by the way, on Netflix. Um, and it looks absolutely beautiful. I, I do want to see it. Um, but there's that there's the opposite. It's the 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 complete other route from pushing your your yourself taking that masculine will and driving it in to taking the complete surrender of self and negation of self to nothing and that both you know both are actually the road like the krishna arjuna the the dynamic the you know right. and and it's 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 like it doesn't really matter which way you go as long as you're putting your entire self into the action of going that direction and and or really choosing to go the only real direction which is towards the middle right and that's mm. that's what this universal harmonic matrix taught me was that whether you're talking about the macrocosmic scales of planets and galaxies or you're talking about the flow and dynamics of atoms and molecules to the quantum scale dynamics of the fabric of space or the cellular dynamics inside of your body the same patterns are occurring. And when you start to witness those little, those little key codes, those, those mathematical codices, those, those verbs of God expressing itself into action, then we gain a glimpse at the reality that, that it's all this beautifully interwoven tapestry and it's self-similar, self-conscious and, and self-evident at every scale. <laughs> everybody yeah, everybody get that I like it anybody not yeah. not get what he's talking about <laughs> wow wow so <laughs> all right so 
and here's here's the tricky part. I know that in my work that leads me all the way through Shakespeare's intense poetry and the drama, and yet he's you know he know he knows he can't prove it, can't prove anything with poetry. Poetry is subjective, right? You can't even yeah. prove what a poet meant. Oh, I think he meant that. No, no, he meant this. This is why mm -hmm. people can look at. Shylock in Merchant of Venice and say, oh, you know, very intelligent, credible people say, oh, you know, Merchant of Venice is anti-Semitic. Come on, give me a break. No. Have you heard of satire? I mean, you know what's going on? I mean, do you know what it means to poke fun at the bad people who think they're the good people? I mean, it's just, he says that. It's very, very clear. And in, you know, Taming of the Shrew, oh, he's a misogynist and he's treating women horribly. No, it's on a much, 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 much deeper level. So you've got to really, really dive into that. And it's not everybody's cup of tea. I, I understand that. What I think is, is everybody's cup of tea is realizing, oh, whoa, I never realized he was that as well. He can't prove it with drama. He knows that. So he says in the last sonnet, this by that I prove. I'm going to prove it to you mathematically. I'm going to prove to you that the, the you, uh, neither one side nor the other is going. You just said it, right? The male, the female, the light, the dark, the yin, the yang, left brain, right brain is an oversimplification. But it's all, what he's telling us all the time is science and art brought together gives you alchemy. Yeah. Alchemize those two, unity consciousness. That's the only place it exists. You must balance those. All your tendencies, all your likes and your dislikes, it's a hard trip. It's a rough trip, obviously, but we just do it day by day. We cut wood and we carry water and we do our thing. And we get lessons all along the way. And I learned, I learned, uh, I learned from you and Jamie and Robert and Nassim and all the people that I've been blessed to be working with over the past couple of years. Uh, it's been an explosion into my life <laughs> where I was just living like a hermit doing this stuff, you know, for, for years. And I'm sure you've had that same sort of uh, basically cocooning yourself away. How long did it take you? Let's, let, let's, let's, let's just go into now where, I mean, you, you, you say some wonderful things. You feel the tingle of entanglement, but it seems like you were playing with that really early on, right? Right away you started to even to do that and, and, and feel that. Can you explain it in terms of, I, you give one of the best explanations of the double, sp double slit experiment that I've ever heard, because you're really, you know, everybody gets tied up over that. Oh, it's, it's a wave, it's a particle. You just show how, no, it's both. It's one thing that is both. Can you, you want to just riff on that for a little minute? And, and then perhaps we need to take it down from the mountaintop and go to Egypt. We've got to visit Egypt again. But let's, tell us, can you give us the double slit experiment? I love when you, I saw that online the other day and it was just, oh, great. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. And then we can absolutely raft down the mountain. <laughs> um, and by the way, Alan, no. you know, you, you have been an explosion into my life of insights and realizations um, that, uh, that you, you, you've changed my life dramatically and you've opened my eyes to things that I really, I didn't know there were such epic libraries that I hadn't yet glimpsed. and your work with Shakespeare and the pyramid and the decoding that you do and the, the level of precision that you bring to it, Alan, is, is just fantastic. The, every presentation that you gave us uh, as the math group, uh, the math magicians, um, Warren Crown Sterling uh, has, has literally been some of the most incredible and favorite uh, teachings I've ever received. So. Thank you for teaching. Yeah. Thank you for doing this Bardcast because <laughs> I, I want to intensely encourage people to continue watching these episodes with you because uh, it's not just about Shakespeare. This is about, this is about the everything and nothing. This is about the universe. This is about the encoding that connects everything together um, and, and how it all really works. Um, and how it all really connects. And uh, you have such an exquisitely beautiful perspective on that. So 
I just want to thank you um, mm, well, for thank having you. me. Well, we can we can end really the we can end the show now. Then uh, thank you, Adam. Well, it's been a great <laughs> podcast, <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next week with. Uh, the next psychophantic guest I can find. Just tell me how wonderful I am. I'll get I'll get I'll because, go on to the double. Because that's really all this is about. It's just, <laughs> just um I just, just it's all about some juice there and let's the go. Eye. We're just warming up for Egypt. It's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my so, god. Thank you, see. Adam. No, thank you. Dear. Yeah. So Okay, here's here's the here's the <laughs> real kicker of the whole thing. Oh, good. Uh, the the real kicker. Okay, uh, when I'm you ready. Really Hold get on. Get down to it. Um, you ready, everybody? Online. Was... Here's, okay? <laughs> here's the kicker. Okay. Get your comments ready. Yep. yep. And now <laughs> I'm gonna, of course, premise the kicker. So, <laughs> so when I was in high school and. And I discovered chi, energy, prana, and I started having these experience with it and, and realized that it was experiential. I also started really wondering why, of course, it's missing from, from our teachings and from school and from science. Like, where is it? And so I did the deepest dives I could into um, quantum mechanics, general and special relativity, string theory, loop quantum gravity, um, every every area of the deepest physics about reality that I could possibly get my hands on, um, and like you do when you're a teenage books. boy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you do when you're a teenage kid, you know, you just get into yeah. quantum. Yeah, you're yeah. a bit extraordinary, Adam. My Let's teachers thought it. I was pretty crazy, but um, <laughs> but I but I was into it, and. And the reason was, is I couldn't figure out how it could be that these brilliant people hadn't somehow uncovered this, right? Like, give me a break. Like, this has got to be there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I dug and dug and dug. And the more I found the edges of where the leading edge unified physics, the, the stuff looking at, like, how do we quantize gravity, right? Like, how do we connect the big and the small, right? All of the stuff where I'd been having these realizations, I was like, oh, well, like the missing piece, the gap in all of these different approaches, the gap that I found was always the slot that's the exact size of the ether, of this fundamental energetic field, this fundamental interconnected lattice. And, and then of course I realized, well, wow, that's interesting because for you know all of these years literally thousands of years with different names from different traditions and different cultures leading all the way up through you know uh early philosophy that was physics you know from pythagoras on and up into the renaissance and even through the what they call the enlightenment period the ether was fundamental. It was all about understanding and breaking it down. So you get like, you know, what fire is, and now we call that thermodynamics, you know, and what water is, and now we call that like hydrodynamics, you know, and what earth is, we call that geodynamics or geophysics, right? So we've broken down the ether into these different things that we've studied, but then it all came down to, you know, a couple experiments, you know, where, where you're really trying to kind of extract this fundamental truth from a place where, uh, in particular, the church could be in control over it. And that was a that was a real problem during Shakespeare's time, as well as in, you know, the centuries to follow where, you know, if you make the wrong claim or you say something that that claims to be like, you know, the truth better than the way the church is teaching it boy are you in trouble i mean copernicus is a great example and then you know when we look at the the reason why guys like edward de vere and john d and francis bacon had to hide this stuff deeply and encode it deeply and get underneath the surface to get this truth out a lot of that was because of this fear and this dynamic with the church and it's the same <clears throat> dynamic that played out that got basically the ether kicked out of science because the hmm. ether was the one thing that couldn't completely be explained and so it was too much and too close to that realm of god too close to the realm of the church um and so a lot of the the guys and scientists they were trying to kind of get a, get around that and explain away things so you end up with mickelson and morley 
And, you know, a lot of people are like, yep, that's the fundamental thing that happened. They proved the ether wasn't there. Yeah, well, uh, the guys basically took a tabletop and they had a laser array, you know, that was creating interference patterns. And they were trying to detect how the movement of the earth through space, through the ether and the flow of the ether would cause waves on that interference pattern. It would actually cause shifts in that laser array, right? And, and that we should notice this, like as if, as if me standing here on the surface of the earth, I'm gonna literally feel the pressure of the earth hurtling through space. And they completely <laughs> missed the idea that perhaps the ether of the earth is a structure that's intact, not just on the surface, but through the atmosphere, that the whole field of space time itself is moving with the earth. And not only that, but maybe the space around earth is actually moving also. And that space is actually the thing that's moving all the time. And the matter's following along. Nassim does a beautiful job of describing this when he describes adding cream to a cup of coffee and it's like, you can't see the coffee spinning, you know, when it's black, but when you add the cream, oh, all of a sudden there it is, it's moving. It's a, it's mm. a beautiful analogy that he does with that one. And so, you know, through Mickelson and Morley, and then with Einstein, you've got Einstein basically doing special relativity, showing how the dynamics of light can work, you know, initiating quantum mechanics, so to speak, by his description of the photon um, as this unit of light. And, you know, really resting on and building on the work of Planck, of course, because there's a huge amount of uh, interplay there in that work. And, and the next thing you know, everybody's like, woohoo, Einstein, special relativity, no more ether, we're good to go, we don't need it anymore. And that's when the problem started. And it took, it took literally less than 10 years and Einstein working on understanding gravity and he produces general relativity and through his production of this story about how space time actually bends and folds and moves around giant gravitational structures, you know, like planets curve mm. space time, stars curve space time, galaxies curve space time and light will actually follow that curvature. And his teacher Lorenz, it took his teacher coming to him and basically saying, Einstein, you know, you just prove the ether exists. And Einstein's like, oh, God, you're right, I did. So basically, <laughs> he ends up doing this whole paper, and it's all about the ether and general relativity. And you can still look it up. You can search it online. It's e called Research Ether and General Relativity, Einstein. You'll come up with this paper. It's still, it's still published in a university you know, journal that the paper is there. And Einstein in detail describes that you can't actually have mechanics in space time without understanding space time as a mechanical structure, which means that it is an ether. Like he's just calling it space time, but it, it's an ether. That's what it is. And in fact, until you understand that everything has this fundamental mechanical field behind it, you will not be able to solve the greatest problems in the universe. And he, he spent the rest of his life looking at the whole universe's expansion and connection between things, trying to understand this fundamental field. While meanwhile, you've got Bohr, who he's arguing with, and you've got, you know, Schrodinger being like thinking that the guys in, uh, you know, in um, Copenhagen are totally nuts talking about like, particles don't exist until they collapse in places and things. And Schrodinger's like, are you crazy? Like, so you're saying if I put a cat in a box, like it's going to be either alive or dead, but neither until I open the box. Like, what the heck does that mean? Right. And and so there's this huge kind of reconciliation process that had to go down. Um, and and by the in the end of it, you know, the ether didn't make its way back in. Um, and we ended up with some pretty crazy, very non-classical ideas in quantum mechanics. Um, and the double slit experiment is really at the heart of that, right? Because we've noticed there's some very specific things with the double slit experiment that if you, you know, you're shooting just a beam and you don't know, and it's spread out, it's going to cause a waveform on the background, right? And you're going to see the wave. But if you shoot individual photons, boom, 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 they leave little point targets on the background. 
But if you shoot enough of them, all the little point targets show a waveform. And there's a, you know, there's, there's been some interesting alternative to perspectives to looking at this as is it's not just, you know, uh, unconditionally like either a particle or a wave, but it depends on if we measure it, right? Like it, th that's the way quantum mechanics, the Copenhagen interpretation has given it this very deep uncertainty. We don't know if it's a particle, it could be a wave and they're different, right? These are two different things. Um, but there was something called pilot wave theory that suggested, well, maybe there's a wave coming off of a point, right? And this, this actually leans towards the truth, but there's problems with pilot wave theory too, because it's still, it's still treating it like this, this object and there's this little waveform coming off of this object. And so if you have a long bar between the slits and you're trying to shoot it, well, you know, you're going to have to pick one side or the other, right? Ah, but we're not dealing with an object, are we? We're not dealing with a silicon bead vibrating in a silicon medium. We're dealing with a field that is actually light itself. And the field is interconnected and communicating with itself. So when you're sending a photon of light, you're sending this spiraling bundle of energy, which is absolutely vibrationally resonating, creating a surrounding field structure that will travel with it. That wave will travel with this sort of little nexus point of energy because it's not just a point. It, it's, a, it's a field that has layers and layers of frequency going out from it. Now, when there's a wall, the thing is, it doesn't matter that there's a wall because the wall is not a thing. The wall is also made of a lattice of light. And light is this thing that has this amazing ability to commune with itself through barriers, through boundaries, through mm. to other areas of the field. It has non-local effects. So even with the wall, you will still get a spread of the waveform on the background. And this is, this is what the, you know, the current guys in most recent experiences have said, ah, pilot wave theory doesn't work because we still get this crazy quantum weirdness that we get these waveforms and the particles mm. indeterminate, we don't know. It still must prove Copenhagen but it doesn't require that. You can actually say, no, it's a fundamental field that's vibrating. The fundamental field may have nexuses of vibration, um, which we call something like a photon, but just because there's, there's a, a nexus in one location doesn't mean there can't also be mirrored nexuses that are actually riding the other layers of that wave. And in the, mm -hmm. in the results, you're going to get the exact same thing as if it's, you know, both a particle and a wave or either one and all of yeah. that. So what you're really coming this is coming down to is that what's the point in, in building the wall at all? Because the photons are going to get across anyway. Right. Uh, um, I think that went uh, uh off from almost political to just back to science then that's probably <laughs> that's probably good i was really i was really going for something else there that the photons might be thought of as uh, whatever let's not go there so <laughs> no point in having a wall so therefore because <laughs> it'll get through man? anyway so anyway it was a long and exhausting day in egypt <laughs> Adam and I were, were just, I mean, uh, this is all brilliant, but you, we, we got to uh, gotta take a breather at some point and let Taking people go, I thought this was supposed to be funny. So, um, no, it, I thought it was, I, no. I, wanted, I want you to see another aspect of the great Adam Apollo. We were in, we but, were by in the way, Egypt. Alan, I would love for you to be on the video too, by the way. I just have my Facebook mirror over here and, I, I really well, I put it on. I put it on you when you're. When, when, me, but I really like to see you too. Okay. Well, I just yeah. wanted to put it on when you when when you're uh, on 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 a on a, a roll and so that everybody. So so <laughs> so that Jill. That after so, the that, eh? that? so that Jill is. Yeah, you know. So that Jill, <laughs> who has a bit of a crush on you, as you could tell from that uh, that promotional video, she said, "Ooh, that gorgeous Adam Apollo sold on Sunday." Enjoy your snooker. <laughs> That's turned into a whole thing. I'll, go to, I'll tell you a bit about that later. So anyway, you and I 
we were pretty fortunate. We were in Egypt last yeah. February. We got in just under the. I mean, we were we were there on what really started out as a resonance uh, trip, but then uh, Nassim couldn't come. Robert was there. You were there, Jamie was there, I was there, about 50 people were on the trip, we were having a blast and we were, we were given the great, we had the great good fortune of, of having a night on, on the Giza Plateau where we did what very few people have ever done, we, we had it to ourselves all night and we could go into all three pyramids and all the main chambers, but, and I want to get to that in a moment, but first, mm -hmm. a little light relief, it was a long, we had a bus ride back from seeing, you know, other pyramids and other things, fascinating things all over the place. But it was a long, long, long bus ride. And I remember this, This we're on our way back on the bus. And Adam suddenly takes the, <laughs> takes the mic. And I, I can't even try to describe it. I'm, I'm not going to try and describe it. I'm just going to let him do some of it for you. Maybe not all of it, because he actually riffed for about three and a half hours and had the bus in absolute stitches just commenting on uh, everything but i'm going to set let me set this up first with a uh, a little promo that i created especially for this occasion <laughs> So. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Channel 24, coming to you live from the center of the universe, Cairo, where the great pyramids encode realms of existence that we have not yet imagined. Planetary systems converge. Here's the heart of Atlantis. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here live, coming to you from the bus, from the origin of existence, the short bus, the back of the bus, the front of the bus, we're all in the bus together here, ladies and gentlemen. And today we are featuring Alan, 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 Alan Green of Board Code, coming to you live, straight and direct from his library, where you can notice all <laughs> the books on Shakespeare and the people that studied Shakespeare behind him. He's got great hair. He's got a nice pin. Alan Green, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, Adam, you're, you're the DJ on this show, are you? You're, you're the, That's you're right, the... Alan. I tell everybody what I like to think about. Oh, it's a great job. I wish I had a job like that. Uh, I work in a factory back in Manchester, uh, mm. same factory my dad worked in. And, uh, you know, it's hard sometimes, but I'm very grateful uh, for being on this, on this bus with you. Uh, I think all those pointed things we saw... There's, there's, there's things that the pointing up into the sky things those would be called pyramids oh yeah that's right those are them those are the pyramids things that we uh, we saw in the brochure yeah um, exactly. i love oh, i loved all of them um it was a bit needlessly big i think yeah i mean i don't know why they didn't just do a lot of small ones really but um you know each to his own uh, i guess they had a lot of space a lot of sand a lot of sand to fill up the space, I suppose. So they decided. They, oh, I suppose that's what happened, right? They just started them and they just couldn't stop. Big friggin' triangles, as far as I'm concerned. Giant <laughs> piles of uh, crystallized monkey poop, actually. Uh, over time, pyramids have been thought to be uh, some kind of very, very special mechanism for energetic generation upon the planet. Some people like to say the pyramids themselves are initiatory capacitors. Other people like to say they are stargates to the Arcturian star system. But as a factory worker, I think you will get down with the more basic premise, <laughs> which is really just that there are millions of stones piled into a giant geometric shape yeah i didn't get the uh arthurian thing uh but whatever you know i mean you had a you had a a, a good education and uh, that's nice for you i remember my dad saying uh don't bother with school mate get a good job like i've got down the factory you know and then i would come home and i'd say i don't like it there dad and he well, I've, I'll never, even, never forget. It was so beautiful. He'd just uh, slap me around the head and say, "Bloody shut up!" And I, I, that's always taught me something. That has to keep keep in my place. But anyway, I'm very grateful for being on this trip and seeing all the, the pointy things. And um, oh, what's that? Is that that's uh, 
What was that uh, that we just passed in, in on the bus, uh, Mr. Oh, DJ? Oh yes, yes, of course. That is a uh, gargantuan living organization facility for massive amounts of military to take part in housing, and in fact. Uh, in this area of Egypt, you know, they like to just continue building housing, whether or not there's anyone to fill it. So we've got literally hundreds of thousands to millions of open apartments available right now for the very low price of <laughs> signing your life away to the Egyptian military. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, you too can have an exactly identical apartment to the next 250,000 people next to you. And you don't even need to decorate because they've got cots. They've got porches. They all have Egyptian flags hanging off the end. And that's right. You can be one of the worker bees for the Egyptian military. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. Just sign right here on the dotted line. And you, too, can own your own piece of paradise. It's beautiful. Really beautiful. There's a, you said there was 225,000 of them in that. What we? Oh, there's another. There's another yeah. 225,000. another gigantic right. wave of another 250,000 housing <laughs> units with exactly zero people occupying them. It's amazing, really, isn't it? it so really anyway, we... quite crazy seeing all the... We went... <laughs> it was absolutely nuts. But the, the, the brilliance, I mean, you, you can't quite grasp just from this brief spell into Channel 24 land. But honestly... Adam would see, he would see what well, anything it would be anything I mean you, you you get into the city area and people are risking their lives constantly right running in in between the buses and the cars they don't care. it They're carrying big Cairo Frogger <laughs> 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 and there'd be like somebody right. be like oh she's coming onto the road the bus is approaching her pretty quickly two cars are coming is she gonna make it and she's like running with the basket like across the highway and it's like oh just barely missed the giant <laughs> You know, everybody on the bus is like trying to peer out the window to see if the lady's okay. And I mean, I had such good material to work with. I mean, even just billboards driving around, you know, you're looking at these billboards I know. and it's like, this message brought to you by Super Pump, the new thigh strengthener that you too can get, <laughs> you know, like just stick it between your thighs and do a little pumping every day. And you too will have a butt just like that white American chick on the billboard. <laughs> It's just like it oh, was. Man. It was. Uh, but it was. You just brought it to life. And the funny thing is, I mean, literally, people were. We, we, we were having a marvelous time, right? But you have to understand. Sometimes we we were on a bus for what? You know, we have to get. You know, say Four tomorrow hours. morning we're going to start at four thirty because we've got uh, six thousand nine hundred twenty-seven miles to cover before <laughs> we get to <laughs> the next pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah. oh, another this, one. This, I know this environment <laughs> looks amazing, this endless expanse of dry desert, but don't worry, after just 300 <laughs> more miles, you're going to see yet another, another dry pyramid. <laughs> <of empty> <laughs> So we were all on our way back and the people were really, you know, they were exhausted and they needed you, needed you badly. And Adam just filled the void. He, he got us on. I forget what, why, I think why you called it Channel 24 is that the, the clock on the bus was always stuck at 24, wasn't it? We didn't know what it was. It was, Minutes, it was actually hours, like a what little radio thing on there. And yeah. the radio was stuck on, on 24. 24. So. Right. I, I was just riffing and I was trying to think of like a, like a, some broadcast station. So I got to think of a name for it. And so I picked 24, um, but you and, know, then uh, later, of course, I thought of some pretty, pretty, some pretty funny things. It's like, Channel 24, it's the answer to life, the universe, and everything backwards. <laughs> Very good. For those of you who don't know, look it up. Um, <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in Reverse. That's right. That's right. Well, anyway, you introduced all kinds of special guests, perhaps none, not all of them we should introduce to our public yeah. right now. Uh, sure, well, sure. If you feel like you want to, we can go for one or two of them. Um, right. I, I remember sitting there thinking, oh, well, God, I hope he doesn't ask me in. But he did after a, a couple. Of, he kept on making certain hints that I should come in. And I eventually did do the thing that you just heard, my dad's voice and uh, all of that. But he could carry the show himself. At the end of it, I was literally, the, the bus gave him a standing ovation it was the most phenomenal thing i've ever 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 seen in terms of stand-up comedy it was like watching i don't know who's big right now you know chris rock or whoever i'm just coming on and going 
bam, in your face for three hours, nonstop, <laughs> making it up as he goes along, and oh, not a not a not a dry eye in, in the house. Everyone. Well, it, I, it wasn't I, me. Really, the you know the guy who carried <laughs> the show, of course, was Chin Long, coming direct to us from the depths of the Shaolin temples in China. Chin Long, do you have anything you'd like to share with our audience today? Oh. Yes, I would like to share with you all that very much consciousness come from mm. deep within. If one learn the place to draw the line between a yin and a yang, you <laughs> find that, that just like a very curvy woman, one can be both black and white at the same time, as Michael Jackson liked to say. <laughs> you must really learn, though, that circulation of qi is the key. So there is no static energy to the yin and yang. The yin and yang is part of actually breathing energy up the spine and then down the front to settle in the dantian. Once one masters this ability, one can find that the field of force around oneself is directly responsive to consciousness. And therefore, one can perceive that oneself is in fact the rice that one is eating. <laughs> and all of that was an ad for rice a that he saw on a, on a, <laughs> on, on a, on a, on a thing. He was like, oh, let's go there. It was, it was, it was beautiful. It, was, it, it more than cheered everyone because we had about a five-hour drive back, and he filled it with three and a half hours of utter, utter hilarity. I wish the whole thing was on a, on a video. And I said to him later, I said, honestly, man, you've got, a can, you've got to develop that. You could have your own show uh, anywhere. You, I, I, I'm, literally, I still think you could do it but of course people would have Thanks to be on a bus yeah in the bus in i Egypt. think i should do it. It. if i do it it should but probably just do with audio because uh it's it's way more fun if you can't see me because then it's just you, you've got all these different <laughs> characters right all right so take us to a station break would you uh please yeah absolutely station break coming up right now uh we have a commercial coming in now so clicking over that's right hi so... everybody <laughs> Oh, sorry, sorry, whoops, sorry. Oh, that's, that's you, go, go ahead. Go ahead, no, 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 that was your cue, go ahead. <laughs> hey, everybody, this is John Lee Schackenburn, uh, deep down in Arrow, South Carolina, and I can tell you right now, we got the best tractors in town. You come on down here, we got a big old red tractor, we got a big old black tractor, we got a big old green tractor. We got tractors with tires so big, you can fit five of your children in them. We got tractors so big, you can pull the dang whole field behind you. We got tractors that will drive on the road, we got tractors that will drive on the field. Come on down to big old tractors, and we got a tractor for you right now on sale. Only 2,400, Ninety nine or something like that. Anyway, it's showing on the screen. I'm pretty sure you can tell how much it is. All right, everybody, have a great day. <laughs> ah, well, thank you from deep down there in the south of wherever it was, what country you were from. I'm not quite so sure because I'm just from England and I don't know anything. But speaking of station breaks, we're going to take one now and a plug for our brand new store, ladies and gentlemen. It's the thing you've all been waiting for. It's just opened at to be or not to be dot org forward slash store we decided to call it so let's roll that ad alejandro brings me to our prize section. On the first three podcasts, we gave away a free signed copy of my book, Decoding Shakespeare, to a member of the audience who had answered a question about something they would have heard or seen during the show. So pay attention, friends, because we're at that point now. Only this time, instead of giving away a signed book, we're going to give away a free Remove the Mask t-shirt. I think I have one here that I've been wearing for about 12 weeks. It's nice and sweaty. You will, you will receive my dirty, unwashed T-shirt, or perhaps we'll send you a new one. I'm not, I haven't quite decided. 
I want to point out this is not a political statement about, you know, removing the mask. We figured everyone would get that it meant remove the mask that covers the identity of the true Bart. You got it, right? Hmm? It's not meant to be taken as a repudiation of CDC's guidelines for protecting those around you from possible COVID infection. I must say I've worn this shirt myself out a lot and it is a great conversation starter. Most everyone gets that it's Shakespeare and they want to know what it's all about. So they, they ask me, so what's, what's that about? So if you're our lucky winner, you'll be helping spread the word about the cause and hopefully getting other people and friends interested in tuning in and barding out every so often. So let me show you again. It looks like this. On the front is the Stratford man, who we've all been told is the real Shakespeare. Get used to it. Don't you dare ask any questions. And on the back is Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, who is one of the uh, leading contenders to be the true bard. But I will stress only one, because I have to say, I've been working on Edward de Vere's stuff for about 16, 17 years, non-stop. And I'm utterly, I mean, there's no doubt he's central to the whole thing. And yet, there keep on coming up other issues and one of them is Francis Bacon and I have to say I'm utterly, I, 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 I'm utterly open to the truth whatever it is I just want the truth so I'm not locked into it one way or the other and therefore we are going to be issuing a Francis Bacon on the back shirt also a Christopher Barlow on the back shirt um, anybody really have my dad on the back if you like uh, just as long as we sell more t-shirts so the idea is <laughs> see I'm learning. Anyway, but point is we'll only know for sure who the true author is once we open that altar, which is going to be the subject of my next masterclass two weeks from today. So anyway, pay close attention to what Adam or I say from here on, because at the end of the show, which is in about oh, nine and a half hours from now, I'm going to be asking a question with... <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> We've only just got started. <laughs> no, I think we've got, what, how long have we got left, Alejandro? Six and a half. Hour. <laughs> what time is it? Uh, ten till three. Ten till three. I think Adam's got to be gone in about 45 minutes, so he's got, he's a very busy person. He's got, he's got a lot, I mean, he, he's doing this as a favor for he us, but he's, us. he's on Joe Rogan at, at six o'clock. He's on uh, Jimmy Fallon tonight at ten. You know, I mean, how lucky are we? It's I mean, we just, you know, it's pretty amazing. You know, of course, I'm not sure that the Jimmy Fallon people are going to enjoy him talking about, you know, DNA structures, etc. Cetera, et cetera. You'll have to liven it up a bit for that one, Adam. So anyway, let's back to my teleprompter. At the end of the show, I'll be asking a question for which you will have heard the answer loud and clear. I will have said it somewhere in the show. So first person to give us the correct answer in the comments section will win a shirt. Just tell us the size you want and an address to send it off to and you'll be a proud supporter of the cause. So thank you very, very, very much. So what do we have next? We've got... Oh, we've got to talk about the Apis Bull. Mm. Oh my goodness. Let's do that. Yeah. Let's talk about the Apis Bull. This was one of the most, I, I, th this was, well, why don't you tell us about it? What, what you know about it, and then I'll show you a little video of us actually climbing up. We climbed up to what Adam's going to tell you about. Apis Bull. What is it? Master, Master Apis Lapis, as they say. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, the, the pyramid has for a very long time been thought to have literally no uh, hieroglyphs or markings, right? And a lot of uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs, as we understand it, um, have sort of several phases. And there's earlier sort of symbolic, uh, very, very more kind of like lettering type hieroglyphs that are believed to be much older and linked to earlier scripts um, throughout history. And a few of those, you know, are really fascinating because um, they could be elements of architecture. Uh, one of the things that I find interesting about, in particular, 
this particular hieroglyph that is described as the apis or the bull um, is is that when you look at Nordic runes, a lot of the oldest Nordic runes in the Fuhark series, especially, um, are actually designs that were used a lot in architecture. So the the structure of the runes matches the structure of the way that they would build things because they realized they could kind of build magic into their structures by bringing these kind of root symbolic geometric understandings into their form. Um, and so, you know, uh, we're, we're looking at the pyramid, we're studying the pyramid, and we realize that the structure of the stones above what's considered to be the main entrance of the Great Pyramid of Giza is actually these two uh, chevron shapes of four stones, and there's a top set and a, a lower set. And the, the symbol of two sort of upward arrows that are broken um, in Egyptian hieroglyphs is the Apis symbol, which means bull. So the actual giant stones that are over this entrance um, are in fact a representation of a hieroglyph, which is really fascinating. That's it. Couldn't have said it better myself. Let me show you. I'm going to show you a picture of them. Um, you've all seen pictures of the giant double chevrons, but this is what they look like. Okay. Actually, we're going to show the video first. This is me and Adam climbing up to the actual Apis Bull. So we are at the uh, 17th course on the on the pyramid here, where the entrance is, and we're looking for something, obviously. Not quite sure where it is because I'll tell you the story in a moment about who who clued me into this. Show me where you think. I mean, this, this it, it was the zone with this craft that we were shining our lights in. That's, that's somebody dug in. And, you know, yeah, I don't see how it's in. Well, let's be, let's be less random about it. We're just going to trace every area meticulously down until something. We don't have a lot of time, though, Ellen, because we only have an hour and a half here because they're not going to let us stay longer than that until. We have to leave at 11. We got here late. So. You're the lead dog. Yeah. Okay. Make sure people are Yep. Start turning it on. Seems to me. Now, just as Robert Grant starts going down, suddenly I look, turn, and there it is, what I'm looking for, right under the double chevron and. Then I did my Lawrence of Arabia uh, thing and looked into this chalice. And here is what I'm now going to show you a keynote of, just to show you the, the, the pictures uh, a little more clearly. So let's go over to this keynote. So, right. So this is what. Adam is talking about and those stones are about 200 tons each we get we estimate this this is it when you're looking from the actual plateau and you see those people sort of down to the lower third of the picture there and to the right there entering where the public entered the Great Pyramid it's called that's Al Mamun's where he exploded into the into the whole uh, pyramid but he missed the actual, the big part that's excavated above it now there uh, to the left. And that is the original entrance. And 
Now, as Adam said, people say there's there's no hieroglyphs on the pyramid anywhere, and the Egyptians usually plaster hieroglyphs literally all over everything. But this is the symbol. This is this double chevron is the symbol hieroglyph for the bull. So it turns out there is the biggest hieroglyph in the whole country right there staring us in the face uh, in the midst of the the north face of the Great Pyramid. Now, what I was looking for, which we were having so much trouble there in that video, was this. Um, it's four letters that a, a, a lady named Jackie Driscoll has sent me a PDF of a paper written by herself and Dr. Robert Schock in which they had investigated these mysterious letters written in a lost language that they determined was most likely pre-Hebraic, pre-Coptic, pre-Aramaic uh, with a root as far as they could tell in ancient what they call Amazigh language groups, sometimes called North African Berber. Now, Driscoll knew of my work focusing on Edward de Vere, and she thought it would be an interesting find. Edward de Vere, it turns out, as most of you know, he was the 17th Earl of Oxford, and he often used ox or o as an ox head as a covert symbol for his name. What Jackie didn't know was that some of Oxford's close friends had a nickname for him, which uh, Adam mentioned there, Master Apis Lapis. Now, no one studying Shakespeare really has a solid answer as to why, but we, we know the term master was reserved for uh, noblemen or more especially for people of high rank, meaning master masons of a secret lodge. In this case, most likely, the Rosicrucians. Now, De Vere's heraldic name, Ox, Oxford, means the bull, and his nickname, Master Apis Lapis, clearly equates him with the bull god Apis. But no one knows why he was, that was his nickname. The additional name Lapis is Latin for stone. It suggests he was connected to the largest known stone symbol of Apis, this enormous hieroglyph at, this, at the true entrance to the Great Pyramid, which happens to be situated at the 17th course. So I'm going to cut straight to Schock's final assessment. Robert Schock, who did this book, saying he'd, he'd noticed this, but he never made any... Uh, any big deal about it. He certainly was unfamiliar with my work because he wrote a book about it in 2005. I'd only got started on, on my work the year before, 2004, I started on this. So he, he had no idea that it might have a, a meaning. But they concluded from these, they, they went back, this is pre-Hebraic, remember, pre-Coptic, pre-Aramaic, and they're looking at very, very ancient languages. And we see here that an this V, or an inverted V, is a, is a D. The, this circle with a line through it is a B, which is always pronounced V, D, V. The, these lines are an I, and this is an R. Looking at a different Tamazic language, same thing. There's the D, there's the B, which is pronounced V. Here's the I, and there's the R. Now, if your jaw isn't dropping open at this moment, uh, I don't know if you're on this planet. It's, I'm, I'm going, what? <laughs> it says De Vere. And in Coptic and Aramaic, it means God shrine or innermost chamber. In the Amazigh languages, its, it's meaning is the innermost, innermost holy shrine. In Hebrew, it means the innermost recess of Solomon's temple, the Holy of Holies. Right? And of course, it's pronounced De Vere. So suddenly, I get this, I'm getting this, this paper from this woman who's saying, well, this might be of interest to you. So we were enormously fortunate. I mean, can you imagine my excitement? It's, I, I was in Egypt. This was my third trip to Egypt. But I, you know, nobody can go up to this. You can't go up there. You're, you're only allowed in at the public entrance. And even though we had the whole place to ourselves all night, this is a picture of Adam and I, uh, just as we got to the chevron. And Adam's shining a bright light into it. And I have to tell you, <laughs> as soon as we put that light on, the police down below, I mean, we had permission to be there, and we paid a lot of money to have the whole site to ourselves for five hours. But nevertheless, they got their rules and their regulations, and they start blowing their whistles. Oh, you cannot go up there. You cannot be up there. You cannot be dangerous, you know. Well, sure, it was dangerous. I was certainly out of breath getting up there. I think Adam was fine. Rob, Robert and I weren't doing so well. And we had, there was one other woman there with us, Val, Val Electra, who is, um, of course... 
the uh, one of the people who was on the whole trip with us. She was fabulous. She might be on the call. I don't know. And she was so funny because she snuck up with us. And if she hadn't, I don't know. We wouldn't have been able to stay up there for that one because the p police started coming up, blowing the whistles. You're not allowed to be up there. Come on down. Come on down. And we hadn't found it. We didn't know where it was. Uh, which, as the video showed, we're looking all over the place. And it's so funny. You know, you can be so in tune some of the time. I should have known. I mean, it's very simple. Just center yourself. Be quiet. Getting to that moment. In Hamlet, he says, I will find where truth is hid. Hid indeed within the center. And I know this, you know, in every every structure of poetry, he's always hiding the most important thing right in the center. And I'm looking all over the place. We're shining a light all over these, uh, these, uh, the apis lapis symbols. And all of a sudden, it was almost too late. And the police are coming up. And Val, God bless her, she was such a, oh, she was uh, Electra is her name, and she was very electric, and she she started to go down and and um, did her best to basically seduce the police uh, so that they wouldn't go. <laughs> I mean, she was going, oh, officer, what's the problem? And she's, you know, she's uh, <laughs> she's uh, being very helpful. <laughs> going, oh, I, we didn't realize we couldn't be up there. Oh, what's your name? Oh, you look oh so handsome. Is this a night shift for you? Where? <laughs> I mean, she was really... She, she was great. great. She bought us another ten minutes, and it was. <laughs> and as a result, thank you, Val. As a result, thank you. Uh, she uh, she staved off uh, the army coming in and arresting us. And I I centered myself for a moment. I went, oh, of course, it's right in the center. Look in the center, and right in the center there, in that picture that was we uh, freeze framed on the on the video, there's a little carving. It's like a chalice in an altar. I mean, it's literally an altar. And there's the and then right in the dead center of it is this word, Devere, in a in a, in a language that is older than any language we know of. How astounding! How astounding is that? I mean, honestly, really. So, Adam, if you want to tell us about, um, we had that night, we had, oh my goodness, we're on, we, we went into every single chamber, but I want you to try and tie it together with what was the big takeaway for you, because there were so many, so many highlights, but was there something that solidified, not, I mean, I had, I had had my moment, right? That was my moment. That's what I'd come for. Robert had his uh, his agenda. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. It's, it's fine. He, he's leading this whole group. Fifty people wanted to be initiated into in the sarcophagus in the king's chamber. I this was the culmination of sixteen years' work for me, and I had to find the name de Vere on the great pyramid. I had to, so I was going to stay there all night if uh, if Val had to sleep with three police officers. I didn't. Care. <laughs> so. I, <laughs> If she had to become Sorry. a doxy, you know. <laughs> Sorry, Val, but you know that's how you were doing it. You were saving us. It was great. So yeah, anyway, she was. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to stay there, as you heard at the end of that. Robert's going down, and I'm saying, "Well, well I'm, I'm staying. I came here to find this. I'm, I'll see you later." We found it, and then, of course, I was a vegetable. I was just weeping. I was crying my eyes out, and I was done. I did. I, I I could have. Isis herself could have shown up, and and I wouldn't have been impressed. I mean, I, I'd had my moment. I was done for the whole thing. Well, place. you might I, have been impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear. <laughs> no, no, it no. It would have been a great follow-up. No, you can't beat De Vere on the opening of the, <laughs> the original opening of the Great Bear. Sorry, you can't beat that. So I'd got my moment. I was satisfied. I, you, I could have gladly gone to the astral right there and then. But so but many things ha followed. We, we we had a whole load of time yeah. in the King's Chamber. We had a whole load of time in the Carfre Pyramid and mm -hmm. in the Menkore Pyramid. Tell us what stood out for you, man, because that was my moment. What was your moment? What what connected this to all the work that you you do? Yeah. Well, first, I just think it's fascinating that, you know, we we got up to the stones and we're, you know, searching and looking up like, you know, like you're looking up high as if it's like going to be up high somewhere or, or like up on this thing. And, uh, and, you know, I find this beautiful teaching even in that where, you know, we often look up to find 
the origin or the source, the thing that we're looking for. But the place where it's written is actually a place where you have to put your head down and you actually have to, you know, in some sense, prostrate yourself in front of the altar, surrendering yourself to be able to find it. Um, and I just thought that that was exquisitely beautiful as well uh, as a teaching. That evening for me was uh, very powerful. It's the second time that I have gone through all three pyramids in one night. Um, and the first time I think I was just literally in the, uh, the wild of the experience and also balancing my, my amazement and my astonishment with, with just intensive study and research and like trying to like see and understand and figure out like how the spaces were built and what, what was used and how old they are and why they resonated at certain frequencies and why certain sounds were uh, particularly powerful in the spaces. Um, and, and that was with Nassim a few years ago. Uh, and then this time I, I realized, you know, I had this much more uh, spacious experience to just, just feel it, to really explore it, to, to make the sounds myself and like get in there and test the frequencies, um, but really fully deeply experience why, why are these chambers the way they are? And what is this really for? And for me, the, the magic was as we journeyed through each pyramid, I began to really deeply understand what they were doing when these chambers were created and realizing that, um, that they are absolutely initiatory gateways and that each one of these sacred chambers is designed to vibrate your being in a very specific way. And so you will have a very specific kind of initiatory experience in each one of these chambers. So the King's chamber is fascinating because it's the, in the great pyramid of Giza, you know, is, is this, is this just like activation, you know, turn it on, like, boom, like this is what it feels like to make the softest sound and have the entire room resonating and vibrating. You know, I, I did some, some work with a, a phone when I went when we went back to the pyramid and went and spent some more time in the king's chamber after this and and I was literally playing with just making the most subtle tone in the exact right resonant frequency like a pulse and then feeling how long the wave was that that pulse would carry through the space um, and when you went when you're in there with a bunch of people and everybody's oming. It's literally like it, the sound itself is vibrating your entire skeletal system and structure. And, it, and it's, it's literally shaking you out of that self-identification of I to, to just feel that you're more than that. Now, the second pyramid, um, the middle pyramid, is, is different in the sense that when you're in that chamber and the sound is moving, you can't help but really feel the circulation of the field with every other person that's in there. It's almost as if every single individual that's in there in the moment with you is meant to be there in the moment with you and that every one of them is bringing a very specific thread of lineage and history and life and genetics and all of these things. And I literally felt as, as though I was witnessing sort of a reunion of the tribes of Israel, so to speak, meaning the tribes of Atlantis, like the different threads of the peoples from different areas of the world. And as I theorize, potentially different areas of our galaxy present and reuniting and weaving a collective field to come into harmony, to find a way to be in communion with each other. Right. How do we match? How do we tone together? How do we meet each other in synergy? Now, that in itself is a is something that I think is is the heart of community building. It's the heart. It's the teacher for how we build community. We have to learn how to be in harmony with each other, no matter how different we are. Now, the third pyramid 
um, the small pyramid, the little one, right? It's like, oh, it's the cute little one, you know? And you think, oh, okay, well, let's just go check out. And, and you go in and there's these beautiful chambers and you go down the stairwell, you know, and, and it's all packed in such a little space, you know? So like when you're going through the entrance and you come to this first little resonating chamber in, in mm. the small pyramid, you realize, Stand. and Jamie Janover, you know, he went yeah. and stood in the corner yeah. and Jamie's just like, oh, oh. And he just like, pulses his voice the softest he could at the right note and the whole room is just like boom boom like it was he was just he was ecstatic because he felt like he was just like how soft can i do this and still shake everybody's bones in this room and 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 then you go deeper and you go in and down this little hall and you're in this little chamber with a curved roof and it's very small and petite and everybody kind of has to pack in there and there's this there's this feeling this feeling that's like my god power and strength and 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 truth and magnificence is not about size it's it's not about how big or how loud or how whatever something is it's actually about how soft and how subtle and how gentle the places that we can be inside. It's the humbler. It's it's the it's the goddess queen who just says, just surrender, just lay yourself down. Like stop trying to be and just let being be and and just love, love each other. And, and that little pyramid is just such a powerful teacher of love and grace. And it's like, it's like it touches the child inside of us, you know, this little vehicle that we're in, but that's full of so much potency and so much power and potential, you know, that's going to steer our whole lives. Um, and so that the, the experience of what the pyramids can do to consciousness for me was was what was so powerful about that night um and and it didn't stop because it led to my journey with the sphinx as well and really the magic that the sphinx can bring oh adam so beautifully put you you so eloquent about conveying that uh what is almost unconveyable Mm -hmm. uh you're right uh, Mencori is, is it was just, it was a, a real eye opener uh, to me as, as well. Mo- most people, I'm sure, absolutely astounding. I remember <laughs> Jamie standing there doing exactly what you're saying and thinking, "Where is that magnificent sound coming from?" It's just Jamie in the corner. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I almost hate to break the mood, but I we we need to now. We're going to ask the question. What mm. the question is that, mm. uh, that, that somebody can win, uh, okay, a brand new T-shirt. I won't give you my old sweaty one. Fine. We'll, we'll spring for a new one. Um, <laughs> the sweat's pretty valuable there, Alan. Come on, I don't know. We should squeeze it out into little drops and sell it by the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to have to invite, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to invite back uh, the, the, this guy, you know, so... Uh, Number Oh, yeah. So, Adam, would you do the honors, please, and uh, have Radio Cairo's most famous disc jockey from Channel 24 read the question that could win someone in our audience a used sweaty T-shirt or a brand new one. Honest. We'll give it the brand new one. So, over to you, Mr. Channel 24. You got it. We're back here. Channel 24, live and alive from the center of the universe. And here's the question. 
that can win you a signed first edition, remove the mask, Shakespeare t-shirt. Get ready to type your answer into the comments section. Ladies and gentlemen, earlier in the show, Alan did in fact give you this useful tidbit of information for if you ever find yourself late one night climbing up to the double <laughs> Apis Bull Chevron mystery entrance of the Great Pyramid of Giza. The question is, if you're ready, how many courses would you have to climb from ground level to the original Apis Bull entrance to find yourself face to face with that mystical ancient Devere symbol. How many courses would you have to climb? Ladies and gentlemen, it's a special number. You better put it down. And what is the magic incantation you must utter in order to open that huge Apis double chevron? Don't despair. The second part of that question is actually unanswerable. No one has yet succeeded in opening the secret chamber of the Great Pyramid that we know of. However, in opening those massive 200 ton megalithic chevron blocks by way of a magic incantation or evenly a perfectly pitched F sharp ohm lasting precisely 3.142 seconds or even the key, which is probably just under the mat at the bottom of the pyramid. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, no, Mr. Green is trying to trick you out of winning the shirt off his back. All we need is which course level is the original entrance located on? The first okay. answer wins a free t-shirt and a brand new set of hubcaps stolen off your very own car next time you're driving in Cairo and wearing something blue. Remember, you must be wearing blue to qualify to get your own hubcaps returned to you during your stay. Channel 24 employees or their relatives are not permitted to participate. Good luck. Good luck, everybody. How many Thank you, Adam. Thank you. So while our audience wrestles with that conundrum, I'm going to ask Alejandro to play the enormously popular promo video of Nigel and Jill at the Podcast Art Gallery. We've been absolutely inundated with, oh, five requests to play it again. So here it is. Nigel and Jill checking out Podcast. Take one. Oh, excuse me, mate. Do you know where the podcast is? The uh, Shakespeare thing. Not my scene, man. Well, we was told it was here. Not really interested, okay? Baddy puffed us in tights. Oh, I'm with you there, mate. I only come here because the missus wanted to see it. <laughs> oh, come on, Nigel. You might like it. Oh, there it is. Look. Nice. You see, the guy on the left, that's Shakespeare. Oh, I've seen him before, yeah. Boring. The one on the right is the real guy. Blimey, you haven't fallen for that rubbish, have you? Oh, don't ruin it for me, Nigel. You always do this. No, I don't. Well, I want to tune in and bard out anyway, so you just go down the pub. All right, and I will. Nigel and Jill checking out Bardcast. Take two. Fine. Suit yourself. He's got that gorgeous Adam Apollo on as this Sunday's guest. Hmm. Enjoy your snooker. Well, as you can tell, the tension was getting a little high and we did ask you to tune in today to find out whether Jill and Nigel's marriage could withstand the pressure of this all-too-common fallout over Shakespeare preferences. It's really destroying a, a whole uh, institution of marriage, I'm afraid, these days. It's, it's just a problem for many couples. Uh, well, I'm afraid I, I, I don't have very good news uh, for you. It looks like another one bites the dust over the thorny problem of Bard versus the pub. Jill's new boyfriend, Rodney, takes seven. Don't mind him. He's sulking. Your ex, I presume. Oh, yeah. Ignore him. Hmm. And this is what caused all the trouble. <sighs> well, he's just not sensitive like you, Rodney. No. <laughs> I understand, darling. I've always been bloody sensitive. Oh, you are, Rodney. It takes a real man to truly appreciate the bard. Thank you, dimple cheeks. Yeah. That is a Shakespeare expression, isn't it? Dimple cheeks. <clears throat> Jill's new boyfriend, Rodney. Take eight. Sorry, line again, please. Well, 
sorry, Rodney. Uh, the Bard is famous for inventing literally hundreds of new words and phrases, but dimple cheeks is not one of them. <laughs> so I, I fear that Rodney and Jill won't even last another news cycle. Meanwhile, Alejandro, drum roll, please. We do have a winner. We have a winner. Yes, we do. We have a winner. The question again was, how many <laughs> courses do you have to climb? If you happen to be in Cairo late one night with the freedom to do it, go up to the master Apis Lapis Bull. How many courses? Of course, 17. So the winner is P.C. Clark. Yes. And I don't know if that is a Mr. or a Ms. or a non-preferred uh, gender or secret personage or whatever it is. PC, let us know where to send your T-shirt, whether you want size. It's going to be the, it's going to be that one. It's going to be the remove the mask T-shirt. You're stuck with that one, I'm afraid. Because and we let us know if you to. want the one soaked in Alan Green sweat or if you'd like a fresh copy. Yeah, you'd have to be, yeah, I mean, perfectly willing to give that one away, but uh, if you, I think, probably you want, yeah, I guess we would opt for a fresh one. Oh, so I tell us know. your size, tell us your address, uh, male or female, or unisex, or whatever you want, we'll send it out to you. PC Clark, congratulations. So, Adam, it's been, ah, oh, man, this is such a riot. I, I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, for gracing us with your pre presence. I know, literally, you're on, what, three? He's on another call right now in about, I don't know, 15 minutes, half an hour. Not quite. But not quite. Uh, not I'm quite. On a, a UFO panel with uh, Grant Cameron and JJ and Desiree Hurtak of the Keys of Enoch. The Hurtaks? Um, at, really? At uh, 520 Pacific time. Uh, wow. But it would be useful to me to have a small break after a two and a half, three hour session. <laughs> <and then have laughs> <it out. laughs> oh, well, uh, we will. Uh, oh, man. I, uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart. We covered a lot of ground, and I, I deeply uh, appreciate your mm. uh, wisdom on all of this. It's been, been fascinating. Is there anything you want to leave us with? I know we th I would like to specifically, uh, I've heard. Uh, about your core, this thing called core that you are re releasing soon. If you wanted to give a sort of a, a little shout out about that, you showed me a bit of a, a preview of, of, a, of a, a promo video for it. And oh my God, is it utterly mind blowing. So I know you can't show that yet because you're still in negotiations with, uh, with Melania Trump and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Tom no, Cruise no. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And the Queen of England, but yes, once it's once England, it comes definitely. through, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> he's in he's in touch with a lot a lot of really key people. Yeah, Elizabeth the first, we're hanging out. You know, we're we're passing love letters. Oh, to she's each other. come back. Oh, great, yeah. lovely. It's, oh yeah, I saw well. I'm trying to I'm trying to get in the mix with the other. You know, with the demeanor nice. and the other yeah. guys. <laughs> get into good company, queen, man. Because... That's all. That's all that matters. Yeah. No, seriously though, it looks astounding. I won't uh, presume to say what, what, what you, you give us your your whatever you want to say on it, and then we thank you for coming, everybody. Mm -hmm. And I uh, I will sign out after we hear from Adam about his latest project that is going to change the world. It seriously is. If mm -hmm. if his uh, if his dream can come true, and if he well, if he uses my technique, frankly. If you do the hundred percent <laughs> thing, uh, it should yeah. it, it should come true by tomorrow afternoon. Really. You know, Absolutely. If he was really in tune, let's face it. But even if he's ninety-five percent up there, if he's getting up there, we can yeah. make it happen. And anything we can all do to help you, Your Majesty. Thank you. Thank you, you, thank you. you are yeah. one of the most talented, talented young people. I, I mean, he is young. Look at him. Look at him. But I mean, goodness gracious! It made me laugh earlier when you said, "Oh, I was in touch the other night on a Zoom call with some young people," and I was going to go and interrupt and say, "Oh yeah, oh really? Oh God, <laughs> were you? Oh, wow, <laughs> that makes me feel great." 
<laughs> no. <laughs> you, you notice how Robert always does that? I mean, it's a, just a standing joke, and I want to go, you know what? It's going to catch up on you pretty quickly, man. You know. And anyway, I plan on <laughs> living, like, like the Dalai Lama told us, I, I plan on living to be 113. And nice. what a perfect number. You know, honestly, on a, whoa, it only just hit me. He said 113. He said, I'm going to live to be 113. Well, 113 is 113th day of the year. 113th, April 23rd, Shakespeare's mm. birthday. Ah. I only just got that. Ooh. It's the center of the Great Pyramid. That When you put 17, 16, 15, 14 into a pyramid of sonnets that Shakespeare has made, the dead center is sonnet 113. Right. I just got right. that as I was thinking. So... Dalai Lama said he's going to live to be 113. <laughs> he probably gave that as a secret message for me. And I was just totally. a bit dense and I didn't get it. That's but anyway, style. anyway, whatever it is, that's how long I plan on living. Because I, if I'm going to get all this out, I've got to stick around a bit longer. Please tell us about your project and when it's going to manifest. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I will also just say that, you know, as as you as you said, you know, we all have to we all have to leave techniques, right? We all have to leave approaches in order to help people to access what we access in our in our own divine realization experiences. Um, and for me, I've I've been you know for a long time the the link for me was always learning what grounding really is and what it means to ground. And grounding is actually about feeling the communion and connection between your body and the core of the earth. But that's not where it stops because the core of the earth is connected intimately with the core of the moon and the core of the earth moon gravitational system is connected intimately with the core of the sun and the core of the sun is connected intimately with the core of the galaxy and the core of the galaxy to the Laniakea cluster, the Laniakea cluster to the universal distributed core and that to the infinite eternal core. So just literally surrendering and letting gravity pull you down is of course, the key because by surrendering you're literally letting yourself be pulled closer and closer to the infinite eternal center of all centers the center that interlinks all things right and so systems technologies things that we build and things that we create there's been a reason why i've been obsessed with building education systems from the resonance academy to the guardian alliance to the visionary arts academy to other client academies and exploring education since my first company access granted back in 2003 and the reason is that i've realized that everything is here to teach us and the tools that we use to interact with each other to communicate with each other and to to build bridges and collaborate with each other those tools can either constrain our ability to find coherence and connection they can abuse us by constantly stopping us from reaching the very people that have asked to hear about our stuff and forcing us to pay money just to like actually get our voices out in the world um, and abuse us by taking our data and manipulating us from the outside or the systems can augment our natural spiritual capacities for self-discovery and self-knowledge. And this is the way the internet was originally inspired, the way it was originally designed. I got to hang out and interview Doug Engelbart many years ago at the International Symposium on Digital Earth. And he shared with me that the mouse and hypertext, he invented literally HTTP, which is at the beginning of every web address that you use. These things were meant to literally be augmentations to enhance the ability of the human system to connect with information. And, and he really looked at hypertext as the first key to telepathy, as the language we can use to access wisdom and knowledge in sort of the Akashic field, as I might call it. And, and I realized over time that a lot of the original birth keys that, that were really coming through these downloads and inspirations. I mean, some of the earliest internet builders were literally calling it the Galactic Communications Network, right? Because they saw that this was gonna take us to the future. And somewhere along the way, you know, you get a couple of big companies and they decide to make money from certain things. And all it takes is a couple bad actors you know, deciding like, oh, okay, well, this is the ways we can make gargantuan amounts of money and we can turn this whole thing into an automated machine where we're literally 
influencing and reading the influence response of people on a daily basis in order to force feed them marketing to to maximize the products that they're going to buy and create this like chain loop um, which google has you know been exposed already in their videos around this sort of control of consciousness in order to maximize profit but the reality is that these systems just like anything can be used for good or evil and what we've been mostly experiencing lately is sort of the trauma response the evil response the the darkness that's coming from the lack of self-awareness and the self-illumination and so it's time now to bring forward the enlightened structures of technology those gifts which return us to the state that augments our natural abilities i believe that our communication systems our websites our our internet dynamics should actually augment consciousness and empower us to see the threads and the language of trust that connects us together that can help us actually map and better coordinate how we commune with each other that give us the privacy that we experience when we have direct communion with other people in our lives and and actually support that privacy being externalized and to to enable us to learn the value of our gifts because that's where the real magic is it's in it's in understanding that each of us are this incredible library of knowledge and gifts and wealth that's just inside of us and all we need to do is learn how to bring that out and learn how to give that to the world and honor that for what it is, both giving it away and also charging for it and understanding there's a value inherent in the things that we're here to share with the world. And through that empowerment of realizing that everyone has a gift to give, thus we have this incredible expansion and growth of art as being the fundamental unit of economy, that, that our true expressions of self are really where our economic system should come from. And, and that if we have monetary systems of exchange built around the honoring of the art within us, then we have something that can last through this age of this earth and into our galactic age as we go forward. Something that's compatible with the enlightened civilizations that have already learned how to steward their planets and who are perhaps around this world as elders caretaking our initiation through this process as young adolescents coming into ownership and stewardship of our earth. So I'm building systems for that. And it's not a quick turnaround. It's not something I can say, oh, tomorrow you're going to get in there. We've been building for over 15 years, um, but this is the year. This is the time. And now all the pieces are finally coming together. The technology is maturing. The partnerships are coming into play. The investors are coming to the table and we are, we are ramping up and building an epic, epic system um, that uh, for lack of a better you know, term for it, uh, I believe is, is the galactic compatible system that we need on this planet uh, to achieve our true destiny. So powerful, Adam. You're absolutely right in er in every way, and I honestly, I I I know internally there's no way that you can uh, not manifest this because the 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 one thing that I learned in that experience that I shared with you earlier was um, it doesn't matter if you can use all this power that you feel you've got. I do this. I've got this willpower. Will, will, will. And you can make a lot happen. And of course, we, history is is full of, of wonderful examples of that and ter terrifying examples of that. You don't have to be on the right side of the light to use your will. Uh, you could use it uh, for utterly disastrous purposes. But if you know you see, all those examples we can look at, you know, you say, well, that was terrible. Uh, Hitler had a lot of power, and he certainly had charisma, and he knew how to drive people. But he didn't win. You know, it, it never wins. It cannot. If your goal is noble and correct and in alignment and resonance, of course, um, then I think it's equ equally inevitable. You're going to attract those same harmonious souls and you're going to make a tremendous difference in the world. And uh, I'm proud to know you. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. Yeah, so it's wonderful. 
So let's all wish Adam well in, in, in that project because he's doing it for all life, for all of us. And it is absolutely critical that we, we do that. And I, th I think we're at that point where we can now. I was just thinking the other day, you know, how, what a terrible state the arts are in. The arts are always in a, in a bad way, right? Always underfunded. I have a presentation about the imbalance of that where the old figures were, oh, you, do you know that for every $99.35 we invest in science, we, in, we invest the other 65 cents in, in the arts? I mean, it's just pathetic. You know, not that we shouldn't be investing the money in the science, but it, it, some balance to it. Yeah. But now, look what's happened with COVID. I mean, literally, uh, I'm in Hollywood here, right? Mm -hmm. No one has any gigs. The entire film community, all the people that are, are dependent on, th uh, not, not just, <laughs> of course, the big time directors and producers, but all the people, the gaffers and the camera people, and the, uh, the, the entire structure that underlies it, all out of work. Same in the theater, same in the music. Uh, it's suffering terribly. So yeah. we've got to do something for the arts more than we ever, ever have done before. Yeah. Not that it needs to be unbalanced at all, but because it is purely that. Alchemy is the balance of those two sides. Science and art have to come together. But, um, yeah, you'll do it, man. I know you will. Oh, yeah, and we it are. Couldn't, <laughs> it couldn't rest with a more or noble-minded person. I really, really appreciate you coming on today. It's been really, really enjoyable. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much, Alan. It's really yeah. a pleasure. And all of you friend. tuning in, support Adam in his project and uh, stay tuned. And, and, and uh, do you want to send them anywhere? What's your website? Uh, AdamApollo.com works. You can just Google my name to find lots of videos. But I, I try to compile most of the different areas and TV shows and whatever that I'm on into that website. And there's a bunch of free music there, too, which I love to DJ and share music <laughs> of different styles that inspire oh, me in different moments in time. And um, yeah, and you can find a lot of my, my work and my projects through there as well. Um, right. So please check it out. All right, and to all of you, I look forward to, I'll be giving a master class on broadcast number five, two weeks from today. And I, I will just mention, it'll be shorter. You know, the last master class I did, uh, it, it, it's, it's great fun to interact with a great, you know, guest artist like, like Adam, like Jamie, like Michael Dunn and Delahoy that I had on on the first shows, and those are the coming. Nassim is going to be on. Robert Edward Grant is going to be on. Uh, the um, I think Pharaoh Khufu is coming on at, at some point. He's going to give a guest appearance. So you know, it's it's always great uh, because that's easy and flowing, and people can sit through three hours of that. I'm not so sure you want to sit through three hours of a master class. So uh, it, it's I want to convey it all to you in, in e easy steps, you know, and in chronological order, sequential order at least, so that one can understand it all and then go back and reference it. But I think <laughs> the last one I did was, uh, three, the only one I did was three and a half hours. Uh, so we're going to cut them, uh, make sure that they are limited to one hour so that people are not uh, afraid to tune in. <laughs> of course, you can, you can click off anytime you want, but, uh, but you can never leave. So uh, <laughs> so we'll be doing master classes that are uh, just about an hour, and that will start in two weeks from now when I'll be giving a master class on the Enochian tables. And then from there on out, we're on to all the new stuff because, my goodness, is there a lot of new stuff. Wow. So stay tuned on that. Tune in, barred out, support Adam in his beautiful core network, and love you guys. See you in two weeks' time. Thank you, Adam.